Good morning, everyone. I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, I would like to welcome everyone to meeting number two of the General Government and Licensing Committee. Uh, welcome to committee members, to visiting members of the Council in attendance today, to members of the public and in the media. You can follow the agenda and debate on your computer, tablets, or smartphone at www.toronto.ca backslash council. The General Government and Licensing Committee acknowledges the land we're meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, the Huron-Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty Number 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, at this time, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, because now I have to also read you the gentle reminder from the Clerk's Office about Municipal Conflicts of Interest. Uh, members, I want to take a moment to remind you that when you declare an interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, you're now also required by provincial legislation to file a written declaration with the City Clerk. The city clerk has provided blank forms to every member's office and asks that you complete or bring with them with you to meetings each time you declare a conflict of interest. If you forget to bring your form, the clerk staff will provide one with you, which you should complete and submit before the end of the meeting. If you need any more information on our obligations under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, I would refer you to the Integrity Commissioner's Interpretation Bulletin which I believe the clerk has a few copies of as well. And if you require advice, I encourage you to reach out to the Integrity Commissioner directly. Uh, I need a motion to confirm the minutes of our January 14th, 2019 meeting. Councillor Holliday, all in favour? Carried. Uh, speakers and presentations, the green sheet is in front of you. I'm just going to run through the agenda. Uh, number one, delivering uh, digital government. We have a presentation on that, so I'm going to hold that in my name. Uh, number two is apportionment of property taxes for as of March 5th, 2019. That's a public hearing, which is scheduled for 9.45. So we'll deal with that right after we go through the agenda. Uh, number, thir number three is also a public meeting or public hearing, cancellation, reduction, or refund of property taxes as of March 5th, 2019. Number four is uh, amendment to purchase order number 6044338 for Toronto City Hall building envelope improvements. Do you want to rock, paper, scissors? Councillor Holliday? All right. Uh, number five, amendment to blanket contract number 47020391 with TBM Service Group Incorporated for custodial services. Anybody? Councillor Holliday is moving the recommendations. All in favour? Carried. Uh, number six, amendment to purchase order number 6045014, Ramston Park revitalization for phase two. Okay. Councillor Nunziata is moving the recommendations. All in favour? Carried. Number seven is amendment to purchase order number 6044203 for total design and construction support services for the construction of a new City of Toronto Marine Services passenger and vehicle vessel. From Ward 24. Anybody want to move the recommendations or hold it? Councillor Holliday is moving the recommendations. All in favour? Carried. Uh, number eight, amendment to purchase order number 6047367 with Deloitte LLP. Councillor Fillion, hold. Councillor Fillion is holding number eight. Sorry, word number nine, go. Sorry, number nine, request to amend contract number 47019536 with ONX Enterprises Solutions Limited for Intel service and related equipment and services. Councillor Fillion's holding number nine.
Number 10, award of request for supplier qualifications number 9134-18-7160 for the pre-qualification of vendors to provide supplementary legal services for insurance defense. Councillor Fillion, holding number 10. Uh, number 11, we have a speaker. Uh, contract award collection services for Provincial Offence Act fines. Request for proposal number 9138-18-7006. So we'll hold that. Number 12, contract award by the bid award panel amendments to contracts and non-competitive contracts approved by the city manager under delegation of authority during the 2000 election recess period. Anybody want to move it? Councillor Nunziata is moving number 12. All in favor, carried. Number 13, expropriation of condominium units at 414 Dawes Road, unit one and six. Anybody want to move it or hold it? Somebody want to do something? <laughs> Councillor Fillion's moving. All in favor? Carried. Uh, GL, or sorry, number 14, 250 year old oak tree, 76 Coral Gable Drive. I did have a discussion with Councillor uh, Pruzzi yesterday that asked if it could be deferred for another month. So there is, there is <coughs> by a few months, so there's a motion on the screen. All right, all in favor? Councillor Fillion, Councillor Karajanis, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Matlow, Councillor Nunziata, carried? One month. Oh, sorry, Councillor Holliday. My apologies. <laughs> Has it been six votes? Lucky number seven. <laughs> uh, number 15, request for, sorry? Let me finish reading first. Request for a report on the feasibility of changing the City of Toronto's policy on statutory holidays. Would anybody like to hold it? Councillor Karagiannis. Number 16, enhancing customer service by reviving permit parking renewals at the East York Civic Centre. I have a motion I'm moving on behalf of Councillor Fletcher. That this item be referred to the Deputy City Manager Corporate Services with a request for review options to restore the in-person permit parking renewal service at the East York Civic Centre and report back to the April 23, 2019 meeting of the General Government and Licensing Committee. Any questions of the mover? Seeing none. All in favour? Carried. Sorry, item is amended. Uh, no. No? Okay. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Okay, we are gonna go back to the beginning, uh, 10 to 10, so we'll deal with item number two first, apportionment of property taxes on the March 5th, 2019 hearing. I have to ask if anybody would like to make a presentation or a deputation on this item. Is there anybody in the room that would like to make a presentation? Is there anybody in the room that would like to make a presentation? So then I have a motion I would like to move. The recommendation number one be replaced with the following. The General Government Licensing Committee approved the apportionment of property taxes and the amounts identified in Appendix A and Appendix B under the columns entitled Apportion Tax and Apportion Phase In Slash Capping, excluding the following application in Appendix A. Original roll number 190-04-3-070-01800. Uh, known as 21 Marquette Avenue for the tax year 2018 in Ward 15. Any questions of the mover? Seeing none, all in favor of the amendment? Item as amended, all in favor? Carried. Thank you. Our next item is number three. 
Cancellation, reduction, or refund of property taxes as of March 5th, 2019. This is a public hearing. It's, there's no registered deputants at this moment. Is there anybody who'd like to make a presentation on this item? Is there anybody that would like to make a presentation on this item? Is there anybody that would like to make a presentation? Uh, seeing none, I have a motion that I'm moving. The recommendation one be replaced with the following. The General Government Licensing Committee approved the individual tax appeal applications made pursuant to Section 323 of the City of Toronto Act 2006, resulting in tax reductions, excluding phase-in slash capping amounts, identified in the detailed hearing and report marked as Appendix A, excluding the following applications in Ward 14, Appeal Number 2018090, known as 429 Danforth Avenue, Ward 11, Appeal Number 2018414, known as 420 Young Street, Ward 21, Appeal Number 2018756, known as 20 Iverdale Crescent, and also in Ward 21, Appeal Number 2018695, known as 1467 Bathurst Street. Any questions of the mover? Seeing none, all in favor of the amendment? Opposed, seeing none, that carries. Okay, and I guess that one. Okay, we are on our first item, uh, number one, which is delivering digital government. And there's a presentation by staff, followed by uh, three deputants. Morning, Mr. Meekle, Mr. Coffey, you can start whenever you're ready. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you, Chair and Councillor Ainsley and the committee uh, for this opportunity to provide you an update uh, with regards to the city's pursuit of becoming a digital government. Um, and, and just before I start this presentation, this is some opening remarks. Um, the Information and Technology Division is, uh, is responsible for corporate leadership of strategy, planning, and delivering on the city's uh, information uh, technology services and solution in partnership with every division um, uh, at the city. So this, is a, uh, this presentation is, is coming from myself, but really is a representation of the collaboration, the partnership that's happening, and the team effort across the city. Um, so as we jump in, uh, move into the next slide, uh, first thing I want to do is uh, realize that, uh, recognize that uh, this is a team effort. Um, we're working with different, <clears throat> excuse me, divisions across the city, but we also have an IT leadership team. And I just want to take a quick moment, just for the committee's sake, to introduce the members of the team that are here today. My leadership team is here. Um, to my left, uh, starting with the Deputy CIO of Technology Infrastructure Services, Lawrence Etta is uh, here today. He is responsible for all the uh, IT infrastructure. Um, also today we have Carthy Bala that's responsible for, he's also Deputy CIO, responsible for all the applications. We have 850 plus applications that he's responsible for managing and ensuring, ensuring that uh, they're operating effectively. And then we also have uh, Rupi Chena. She is uh, the acting deputy CIO for architecture and portfolio delivery. Architecture is making sure all the pieces fit together and portfolio delivery is all the new projects that we are delivering. And to my left uh, with me here today also is Grant Coffey. He's the director of strategy and program management, making sure that we have all the strategies but making sure things work collectively across the organization and with our partners that we work with. So jumping right on in, um, you know, our mandate is to really drive innovative information technology solutions that enhance uh, the delivery of city services. And really, the word innovation tends to be used quite a lot. And in, as part of our definition, really innovation is really how can we do things better. So we're looking for opportunities day to day. We're looking opportunities in terms of how the city delivers information and services. 
uh, using technology and data to enhance those services. So about us, uh, we provide leadership, as I mentioned earlier, um, in terms of really driving business modernization, leveraging technology and data to enhance service delivery. Uh, we look at ways at streamlining, modernizing, um, and integrating the various services so that we can drive an integrated uh, citizen or business service experience. And then with all the technology that we've implemented, making sure that it's secure, reliable, um, adaptable, and agile for ready, ready use across the city. A little bit on our operational footprint, <clears throat> excuse me, as mentioned earlier, we have 850 uh, business applications across the city. And those applications uh, typically uh, are not static. There's different things that we're doing to keep them up to date, changes that we're making, reports that are required, uh, upgrades, et cetera. Uh, we support 29,000 users, which is, uh, re results in approximately 187,000 service, service desk requests. So people asking for information and services on how we use those platforms. Um, um, we have our city website, which is one of our main channel for citizens to access information and services. We have 19,000 mobile devices, so that's smartphones and tablets being used across the city as we're becoming increasingly not only digital but mobile. Um, and you see the rest of the statistics there is in terms of the footprint that's available at the city. Um, so when we're talking about innovation, what we did is we really uh, built upon leveraging industry best practices. And one of the models that we're really leveraging is a model that was created by uh, the McKinsey Group. And when defining and delivering a digital footprint, it really starts with a relentless focus and attention to the resident, the visitor, and the business, uh, the business users of the City of Toronto looking for opportunities on how we can deliver functionalities and capabilities that enhance their experience. And that is so important. Before we get into any of the other components, it's a focus on the citizen, it's a focus in on the business. And what we then do is then, as we think about the digital government framework, we look at services that can enable those functions, enable those capabilities, i.e. online service delivery, i.e. integrated service delivery, looking at our underpinning business processes to make sure that they're simplified and automated so that we can drive an integrated service delivery experience, but also enabling good decision making and also sharing of data. Underneath that are enablers that foster innovation. So making sure we have the right strategy, the right organizational model, making sure we're developing the right skill set within the organization as we become increasingly digital, and making sure that the technology foundation and footprint um, is agile, adaptable, and secure to provide innovation for the city. And um, a couple of examples, I'm not gonna go through all of them. What you see here is that our city, um, uh, through the digital footprint, adds value to our citizens. Um, there's a lot of data, a lot of information and services that are consumed every single day um, by citizens and businesses of the City of Toronto. And as we become increasingly digital, we become increasingly dependent on our technology footprint. So you can see as we're actually going through a weekend of our recreation uh, registration, even today, um, we look at 311 where people are utilizing the telephone to call in and uh, um, place uh, request information or place service requests. Um, our permitting and licensing are all on business systems that enable those processes. Transportation is using data, um, data analytics to make better decisions, get insights on how to improve operations, and we're collecting um, a lot of revenue through our various systems. Uh, we also use systems to run the city. There are a lot of the business systems that run a very large, complex city, largest city in Canada. Um, there's an increasing pressure for us to identify operational efficiencies through the systems that we use, not just independently, functionally, but how they all integrate together. So there you see a couple of the examples of the functional areas that have a huge dependency on running the day-to-day -day business of the City of Toronto. And so as we uh, move forward, uh, really uh, some things are changing. Uh, the city's always been involved in technology. Technology is not new. Technology predates probably every single one of us in this room. But the landscape has changed. The, the industry has changed. And what has changed? Um, just recently, actually, just this past month, the, uh, the CRTC released an updated report. And in that report, it says that 88% of Canadian households have mobile services. 
Um, also in that report, it showed that 67% uh, of Canadian households have landlines. So we're seeing a, a major shift um, in terms of our society. Um, there are more mobile services in people's homes than there are landline telephones. What does that mean? Our citizens and our businesses are becoming increasingly dig uh, mobile, and how people interact with one another has changed, and how they interact with government has changed. People are expecting um, somewhat uh, to, it to be there, that they can access information any place, anywhere, anytime. The other thing that's changing our technology landscape is cloud computing. There's a lot of talk about cloud computing and what it means. For us, cloud computing provides an alternate opportunity for us on how we deliver technology solutions. And I like to compare it to the utilities. If you think of electricity or power, uh, it would be rather complex if every home had to build their own power generation in their, in their homes or every community. Instead, they consume that power through the utility, through our hydro companies. Cloud, computed, cloud computing has presented that opportunity to businesses worldwide that we now can consume uh, computing services uh, through the cloud. In addition to that, we're also seeing uh, big data explode. And what that means is there's a lot of data that's being made av uh, available, data within the city, data outside of the city, and that gives us insight, but also foresight, and allows us to do the analytics to make good decisions, but also to drive the service efficiency, service improvements, and customer service enhancements that we're looking for. Artificial intelligence is another one. That's allowing us to bring information and uh, collate together, but gain some additional insights. Uh, the City of Toronto is actually a real center for artificial intelligence. It's one of the largest um, hubs for AI companies are actually in Toronto. And then we're seeing things like the Internet of Things and smart cities, which really means uh, internet enabling uh, technology, utilize, utilizing things like sensors, smart traffic, smart buildings, um, smart vehicles, the list goes on. How do you use all of these new services, new technologies that have been introduced fundamentally to improve the quality of life for people that live, work, and play in the City of Toronto through economic prosperity, environmental sustainability, and social advocacy? So these new technologies are being introduced, and what we're trying to do is move from a city that's reactive and how we can be responsive to the demands of our citizens and our businesses. And so as we move forward, uh, there's a lot of technology, but technology on its own, it can be very fascinating, it can be challenging, it can be intriguing, but really they, they're there for a purpose. And the purpose is to drive the priorities of uh, City Council. And uh, some of the priorities that we are fully aware of are, are listed up there in terms of housing, mobility, modernization of the city, financial sustainability, and improving the employee experience. And so what we've done is we have matured our governance model to ensure that the enabling technologies that we're in, putting in that are fostering the introduction of function, uh, uh, functionality and capabilities are driving the city's priorities forward. And so what we've done is in terms of our overall governance model, um, we have a very uh, a formalized and rigorous process on making sure that we are ident identifying the value proposition that will be delivered to the city to move these priorities forward along with on other sets of priorities in the city. And so what we do is we uh, actually have formalized business cases that are submitted. We weigh it against those priorities. We weigh it against the return on investment that we will achieve. And we measure return on investment in a couple of categories. It can be cost savings, cost avoidance, operational efficiencies, time to market in terms of delivering our service, improving customer service. We take all of those together and making sure that we're creating a digital footprint at the end of the day that is bringing value to the City of Toronto, but also value in a timely manner. And so as we do that, we, uh, we look at our investments. Uh, our investments are really in two categories. There's capital investments, but there's also operating um, investments. And what we've, we've actually just recently compete, <clears throat> completed an IT benchmarking study that compares our operating expense and spend versus the industry. So within the public sector, you can see where Toronto lies. We're about middle of the pack in terms of the percentage of IT spend compared to the overall city's budget. What is also, you'll also see there on the right, um, uh, comparison to the private sector in terms of our spend, which is uh, a, a li uh, on the lower side compared to the industry. Uh, when we're talking about operating expense, I do want to draw your attention to something. Approximately 50% of the city's uh, IT operating budget is really to run the business. So that's like keeping the lights on, keeping things going, keeping the services up and going. 
The other 50% is to grow and transform the business. When I say grow, that would mean like if we have an application and we have 15 licenses and we need five more because it's being used more, that would be considered growth. Adding more devices would be considered growth. Transform, which is a percentage of our operating budget that uh, some of our staff are working on, it's looking at our business today and how can we do it better and drive further transformation within the organization. So our operating budget, as you see from a macro level in terms of compared to the industry, does include run, grow, and transform. And so as we move forward, um, we also look at um, delivering new capabilities, and that's predominantly through our IT portfolio delivery. I mentioned earlier that we have a governance framework where we align our investments to key priorities. We measure those investments to make sure we're getting the return on the investments in a timely manner, but we're also measuring to making sure that we're getting the functionality and the capability and the adoption of what we're implementing. So we have a portfolio, and in our portfolio, we do the planning. It's making sure that we're doing the right things but we also have portfolio delivery to make sure we're doing the things right. Um, in other words, we have portfolio overall metrics to make sure that we're measuring how projects are being delivered on schedule, on budget, but also delivering the capability. We have some examples of some things that have been recently uh, delivered. Um, it's, it's good to know, it's very important actually to know that, you know, uh, that uh, there's a return on investment, but again, it's not just financial, but it's also value to the city. Um, here are some examples of some improvements with a focus on some of the social and economic benefits. Uh, we have an equity lens uh, application, which is an online application for analyzing equity and diversity impacts. Very important to align to the city's priorities. We have Wellbeing Toronto, which is an application that gives us various indicators about communities within the city of Toronto. We have things like Vision Zero, which I, I'm sure everybody's familiar with, where we collect collision and traffic volume do some data analytics so that we, we can not only plan for today, but plan for the future. And then we also recently introduced last year our open data master plan. Um, Councillor uh, Paul Ainsley, our chair, is actually the champion of that, has really led uh, the impact of driving that open data master plan. And I just want to take a little bit of time to actually talk a little bit about our Open Data Master Plan. And it is important because the Open Data Master Plan is a vehicle that fosters um, citizen and business engagement. It's about making data available so that others can use it. And when I say use it, um, create applications is one use. But another one is as we broaden our, I call it our ecosystem, we make data available, it presents opportunities for others, whether it be interest groups, stakeholders, to be a part of solving real civic problems. And so if they have the data, they can come with recommendations and suggestions. And we've seen that countless number of times where some of our greatest ideas, best ideas, have been from people that have taken our data, made some recommendations to the city, and we've been able to run with it. So our open data program, um, our actually our open data master plan was actually co-created. When we were creating the uh, master plan, we um, co-developed it. Um, we did a series of workshops with different groups across the city, got their input, got their um, prioritized on the things that they are interested in, and, 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 and shared some of the challenges that we have and allowed them to contribute into the creation of the plan so that we can improve um, the government's efficiency, operational effectiveness, and at the end of the day, remove barriers so that we create more of an open, transparent, and engaged government. Our open data master plan is actually organized into really four themes. The first theme is a foundation, making the data available, making it easily available. That include the introduction of our open data, new open data portal, easier to get to the information, easier to utilize it. Uh, integration, um, how do you integrate not only the data, but share the data across various applications. Um, connection, making the data available to communities, not only locally, but literally could be available globally because it's online. And activation, um, encouraging the use of that data um, and, and a continual process of adding more data sets that will foster more engagement. And so the open data portal uh, was launched, as I mentioned earlier, in May of last year, 2018. And there you see an example of really one data set, uh, which is the on-street uh, permit parking area maps, um, which allows people now to take that data and be able to get some insights and information in a way that is of interest to them. And it's been actually very, 
it's been quite a learning process as we, I call it an iterative process. We find out what kind of data sets are available. We have an open data policy that encourages across our applications, across our business units, how can we make more data available. Uh, we have good information management practices, but also data governance practices that ensures that we're protecting things like privacy, but at the same time creating an open and transparent government. In terms of open data, we uh, just want to give you a bit of a, a snapshot of how the data is being used or the demand area. We're seeing, in terms of our themes, a lot of downloads um, in the area of transit and location and mapping, city infrastructure. Um, again, some metrics, we have about 292 data sets, but over 2 million downloads of data uh, each year. So uh, it shows that the data actually is being used. Um, it's creating an opportunity for to welcoming innovation. It's creating an opportunity to foster more dialogue and again, to co-create solutions for the city. Um, and as we move forward, um, or at, taking a little, uh, as we move forward, we also recognize some of the things that we've done in the past in 2018. And here's a snapshot of some of the uh, projects that were completed in 2018, um, starting off with an election, which, which is the largest municipal election in, of, of course, Canada, but probably one of the most, if not the most automated election process, where by the time the election was completed, within 15 minutes, um, due to the technology and the automation, we were able to pull the results and publish the results. I think that speaks to the city being modernized and really leveraging technology uh, right in its municipal practices. Uh, we've recently implemented an enterprise customer relationship management solution, which is a cloud-based platform which allows us to offer information and services um, across various functional areas. Uh, last year, we laid the, the platform and we started off with a, a pilot, actually, a proof of concept. And the first proof of concept was within Toronto Water, where now, uh, before you used to have to place a phone call if you wanted to turn on and off water, uh, your water services, but now you can submit that request online and track where that service request is online, similar to you, you would with other services that are offered by other companies. So we're gonna be introducing more and more of those services. We laid the foundation last year. We're gonna be turning on more services in this year and as we move forward. We also completed our uh, payment card industry, which we call PCI, uh, Compliant Merchant Certification. A lot of words. What does that mean? We are the first Canadian municipality to receive level one certification. In plain language, due to the volume of financial transactions for the City of Toronto, we have achieved the highest level of PCI compliance there is. And so we're up there with um, the big retail companies, um, uh, the banks, et cetera. That's the highest level certification. And that's an accreditation uh, ready to various units uh, across the City of Toronto, just really continuing to making sure that we're putting in best best-in-class uh, processes, methodologies, and technology. Um, and as we move forward, we're gonna continue to foster, um, really improve the digital workforce by making um, a Wi-Fi available across our administrative buildings so that we can be mobile as a workforce and drive further our productivities. The city has been recognized for its accomplishments, uh, recognized for its accomplishments in, in various forms, um, whether it be the city manager's awards, whether it be industry periodicals like uh, the Municipal Information Systems Association. We just listed a couple of the awards that the city has been recognized. We also received the 2017 Digital Transform Transformation Award for a large public sector organization for the vehicle for hire, which went predominantly from a 90% manual process to 100% digital process. Um, and so the city is committed to looking at how we leverage technology to improve our services, but also improve our operations. Moving forward, um, we are committed to modernization. And when we talk about modernization, it's really looking at how we are delivering our services, how we're running the city today. And the way, the way we've organized ourselves, instead of tracking just by projects, we have approximately 125 active IT projects. Those 125 active uh, IT projects are expected to deliver a return on investment approximately just over $120 million over the next 10 years. And rather than tracking just a list of projects, we've organized our projects into uh, sets of programs. 
And here are some of the examples of some of our major programs that we're tracking um, this year. Right from digital services, looking for opportunities to improve customer service through digital self-service opportunities, through making different service channels available. We're continuing looking at our work in asset management so we can drive better integration and information around our service requests. Human resources transformation, how we run our HR systems. Finance transformation, looking at our finance systems, so looking for more opportunities for simplification, timely reporting, et cetera, um, and also in our supply chain transformation. So uh, just a sample of some of our programs. Again, I'm not going to go through them all. I think the information you can follow through there are definitely open to questions on any of them. And as we move forward, um, there's some foundational initiatives that are going to help us continue to drive a, a, a digital government. We've created a smart city framework, and uh, when we say smart cities framework, that is really utilizing technology and data within the city, but also technology and city within the Toronto ecosystem, within the industry, within the ICT industry. And so there's a lot of opportunities, there's a lot of products and services that are often presented to the city of Toronto. Our smart cities framework is going to give us the, the governance and the prioritization model so that we can identify high value opportunities for the city um, as they align to our corporate priorities and also foster working across other partnerships with industry, other levels of government so that we can drive um, more value added services for citizens and businesses in the city. Underpinning all of that is our technology roadmap. Since we have a very large, complex footprint, part of it is making sure that that footprint is available and secure, but at the same time, making sure that we're managing that footprint in a cost-effective way and making sure that that technology footprint is agile and adaptive and responsive to the business needs. So we're creating a technology roadmap so we know where we're going, we can align our investments accordingly, but at the end of the day, making sure that all the pieces fit together because we're driving towards and never losing sight of creating that integrated citizen experience. So if all the technology are disparate, it'll be a lot more challenging. So our roadmap is to foster that integrated service experience. Uh, we're committed to cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a top priority. Uh, significant investment for us in 2019. We continue to strengthen our posture, our posture internally and externally um, through various programs, checks, and monitoring. And then, of course, in order to do that, we need to make sure that we're developing talent that can deliver on a lot of these solutions, but also manage the, the platforms that we have in place. And I mentioned earlier, we're doing um, a benchmarking study that we're just finishing up. So some of the critical success factors for us is um, focused on integrated service delivery. We want to ensure that the pieces fit together, um, 44 divisions, multiple service offerings. How do we make it simpler and easier for citizens and businesses and visitors consuming information and services in a digital way at the City of Toronto? Creating an innovation culture. Innovation culture means it's not about delivering like a product or a service. Innovation culture means everybody's thinking about how can we do things better, whether it be small or large. And sometimes it's the sum of the smaller pieces that lead to large incremental change and transformation. So we're committed to trying to drive that innovation culture, um, enhancing cybersecurity. It's one thing to say that we're becoming increasingly digital. As we become increasingly digital, we have to ensure that our security posture is very strong. Um, and creating the organizational capacity and demands, um, uh, organizational capacity and readiness um, through skills, but also through partnership. Anything in technology is really a collaboration and a partnership. Um, it is working with the various divisions across various levels of the organization and making sure we're sequencing things in a, an effective way that delivers value. And then, of course, optimizing our existing investments and future investments as we move forward. And then finally, just to wrap it up and open it up for uh, some time to questions, uh, never losing sight of what our purpose is. And we can talk about digital government, we can talk about technology, we can talk about data, but at the end of the day, it's to improve the quality of life for people that live, work, and play in the city of Toronto. We just recognize as we become an in increasingly digital government, we have to make sure that our digital infrastructure is in place to facilitate the service offerings that drive economic prosperity, environmental sustainability, and social advocacy. 
And so that's our commitment. Um, we never lose sight of that. And as we put the digital government framework in place, uh, we want to be able to measure, clearly measure, where we're driving improvements, where we're driving efficiencies, uh, where we're driving um, um, customer service improvements overall for the City of Toronto. So with that, I will pause and see if there's any questions on uh, any of the information. Okay, thank you, gentlemen. Much appreciated. Um, I saw Councillor Matlow first, Councillor Fillion. I think everybody has questions. We'll start on this side. Councillor Matlow. Uh, thank you for your presentation and, and the work you do. I've got uh, two or three questions. Uh, the first one more internally focused and the others uh, externally. Uh, the constituency management system that uh, councillors have access to, um, it is, it, I don't know if you've explored it much, but there's no like direct there's no direct application that we can download it's a kind of a very hidden seemingly hidden web-based app where you have to kind of go go into a, a a book that we have and then figure out where the link might be and then get that link and it's very awkward to get to and i don't know have you ever been asked to or have you ever on your own initiative explored a better way to provide counselors uh, whether it be web-based or a mobile app, but but a direct way to be able to connect directly into on their phone uh, a, a constituency management system so that what, what we often encounter is that you might be at an event or at a park or walking down the street or you're on your way to a big meeting and you want to be able to refer to uh, your constituency management system to be able to look up a situation. You want to know, for example, where things were left off at, et cetera. Have you explored that at all? And if not, would you be willing to? Uh, through the chair, great question. Uh, actually, our chair has often asked me that a similar question. Um, um, to answer that question, the way we are organized um, at the City of Toronto is uh, applications that's related to councils is managed through our, our clerk's IT. Oh, that's entirely through clerks. Yeah, uh, but count, our chair has brought this one to my attention a couple of times, and so... Do they have the expertise, though, that you have? Like, would you... Do they, do they have the ability on their own to do that, or would they need your assistance? Uh, we definitely work closely together. They more, I would call it on uh, front end, um, and where, where they do need some uh, deeper skills, they would come to us. Um, but I'm going to take your question, uh, again, through the chair, and, and let's see, because it's come up to me before, let's see if we can go back and um, Thank you. maybe work with them and see if I, we can I come appreciate that. So then everything. more externally focused, uh, cities like Boston, which you know kind of led the way back back in, I think, like 2002, 2003, and other cities uh, throughout the country, throughout the United States and, and elsewhere, have um, 311 apps, some web-based, some mobile, that are uh, far more interactive than we have today here in Toronto. You can, you can send pictures through it. You can, there's all sorts of different services. Yeah. And a consistent complaint that I receive from residents is that um, they, don't, they don't find that our outward you know, whether it be web-based or we don't really have a, a mobile app that you can download. Um, they, a lot of people rely, as you know, rely on, you know, their phone or through their watch or whatever, and they'd like that direct connection. They don't have that with us yet. Have you explored that? Uh, through the chair, uh, thank you, Councillor Matlaw. That's a great, great question, <clears throat> great observation too. Um, we recognize that the City of Toronto, in terms of its 311 application, um, large, complex, yeah. heavily customized, which is a little more limiting to easily implement, say, in a mobile app. What we've done is we've recognized we've actually outgrown that in terms of being agile and responsive, not only the council's needs, but citizens' needs, et cetera. So what we've done is we're, part of our technology roadmap is to get off of our existing application, and that started by us moving to an enterprise uh, customer relationship management solution. And so that rollout, and I gave you an example, that's going to give us the ability now in a more simplified application to be able to offer more mobile services through that window. And so we are heading that direction. Um, Some of the services, for example, that residents often, uh, you know, those who have had these conversations with have uh, cited, like, for example, they see a pothole. They'd like to just be able to, you know, just open up their app and click on the address where that is. Uh, they see uh, a street hasn't been uh, plowed uh, for two weeks. They'd like to be able to deliver the name of that street through the app. Um, various things that they, that they see around the city, a stop sign is broken and fallen down on the ground. They'd like to take a photo of that and then uh, enter that and then send it to, uh, to the right person at 301. 
Uh, agreed, again, through the chair. We do have some third-party applications that yeah. are doing some of that, but... That's different. It's different than I think what you're asking you for. I, th I yeah. think what you're asking for is the ability through one window you got to be it. able to access one any service. One-stop shop. That's where we're heading. So when we're yeah. talking about integrated service delivery, that's where we're heading. We have some mobile apps or services available today, but not to the extent that I think that you're requesting. Thank you. So I'd like to work on that with you, or at least support the work that you're doing. Last, uh, with the, the 20 seconds time remaining, uh, I've uh, moved a number of motions with, with regard to- Sorry, Councillor Matlow. Sorry, before you get to your next question, I'm just gonna stop your clock. Sure. Gary York was just kind of waving his hand. He's oh. in charge of 311. I think he just- It, 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 it was on. Uh, hi, my name is Gary York. And uh, the bottom line, in terms of the mobile uh, experience. We're definitely looking at doing that. We've actually looked at, um, with the new technology that we've interfaced with, and the mobile functionality, that's definitely in our roadmap. So we are looking at potholes that can be put online. The only challenge is if you're driving, you shouldn't necessarily be using your phone. Of course not. But, but having said that, absolutely, the road, uh, mobile functionality, uh, definitely with the potholes, better, uh, even no notifications and pushing. So what's happened in the past, when 3.1 was initially created, it's inbound. We're always taking in the information and not necessarily disseminating it in a, in, a, in a more proactive fashion. With the new technology and solutions that we're looking at implementing, the primary goal is to change that. It's to push the information and actually close the loop. So any service request that you create, either online or whatever the channel that you've chosen, chosen because we've in the past dictated the channels in which the public would communicate to the city. We're now opening that and providing the public with choices. And with those choices, it should be a seamless experience, depending on if it's email, depending on if it's Twitter or mobile. And that's exactly what we're focusing on, and we're looking to have that implemented in the very, very near future. Okay, that's that's exciting. Thank you. Absolutely, it's very exciting. I look forward. I'll sit down with you at some point soon just to learn more. Absolutely. And discuss. So then, uh, just with my remaining few questions? seconds, yeah, I just, I just, I just wanted to get in uh, that. I, along with others, have moved motions uh, uh, with regard to expanding the availability of Wi-Fi to challenge the digital divide and to create a more tech-friendly city. And uh, that included uh, TCHC homes, but also uh, public spaces, Nathan Phillips Square, public spaces. Boston is another good example, but there's other cities around the world that have these public spaces where people can go open up their laptop, open up their phone. You're a visitor from another country. You don't have a roaming plan. You can get some business done. Uh, you can FaceTime with your spouse, whatever. Um, where are we at with that? Because I know that we uh, long ago discussed your undertaking of that, and I just haven't seen much progress. I've seen incremental progress with respect to our, our civic centers, et cetera, but not in the public space. You asked quite, through the chair. There was a lot in that. I'm going to break it down in a couple pieces. Sure. So in terms of making Wi-Fi widely available, uh, yes, there have been a series of motions. Uh, we've had a very long list of deputants in terms of the receptivity of Wi-Fi in like park spaces, as an example. I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, and so what we do is we actually have, um, and actually t in tomorrow's, uh, it's tomorrow, right? Tomorrow? Tomorrow's economic development or economic and community development. I know I'm butchering the name. We lose track of the names <laughs> now too, yeah. <laughs> tomorrow's committee meeting. Um, um, there's actually a motion coming forward and we're, we're starting to make some traction in terms of Wi-Fi in uh, uh, city, public facilities. I'm aware of that. That's not, I, I'm aware of that. I'm talking about the the, the, the outdoor public. So the outdoor squares. public, so back to the outdoor public, a uh, couple of things. Um, you're aware of the feedback we've received from citizens and special interest groups. And I also know that we want to make evidence-based decisions as well, so. Okay, so, yeah. okay, great. So you're aware of that. Last second question, Councillor. And then, and the second one is making sure that we have a sustainable financial model to do that. A lot of these cities, and predominantly across North America, time's running out for me to go through more details, but in, across North America, the cities that, that have made those investments have been unable to support it. The majority have had to pull their infrastructure out. And so when we look at Wi-Fi in some of those spaces, we want to make sure that we have a sustainable business model in terms of who's going to pay for that and how okay. over an extended period of time. Okay, I'll follow, up with, you. I'll follow up with you on those two items. So. Okay. Okay. And I appreciate that. Thank All right. You. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Sorry, Councillor Nunziata, do you, do you have questions? No? Okay, so I'm going to go down the side. Councillor Karajanis. Good morning. Good morning. Following up on the, uh, through the chair to staff, following up on the request about uh, mobile uploads to go to 311. Uh, 
Mr. York, how long ago did I put that request into you? Uh, through the chair, about approximately three, three years ago. Thank you. How hard, through the chair, how hard would it be to get something on our website to load up pictures? How long will it take a, a guru that, uh, 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 that does websites? How long will it take? Uh, it doesn't matter, I mean, anybody. Uh, through the chair, we are looking at that functionality. It's definitely on our roadmap. And with the new solution that we're implementing and piloting, uh, it's, it's, it's already there and it will be rolled out to everyone once we've standardized that solution. I'm, I'm going to go back and I know, Mr. York, that you, you probably have some, some knowledge of, of computer and all that stuff, but I'm, I'm looking at the, 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 um, the website guru. Please provide me an answer. How long will it take for an app to be put on our website? Five minutes, ten minutes, one year, two years, three years, how long? Uh, through the chair, a couple of things I think you said there. So there's your original question on how long would it take to upload, a, let's say, a picture to, through our website versus creating an application. So there's, I think you said two things. I just want to clarify that. So if in terms of... Sorry, uh, I'm sorry. Through the chair, I said how long will it take us to put that on our website? To put, and I'm just asking for clarity through the chair. Put what? The picture or the application? The application. So the application through the chair, the application, um, uh, counselor, is, is not the complex part. What we need to make sure and as we I talked about the digital government framework, is that we have the processes in place so that when that, whatever it is, piece of data, picture that comes in, we can service that request. So um, if we take a picture and we send it in, we email it into 311, and it's about a pothole, about uh, a complaint, does that make it to the uh, bylaw officers or the transportation uh, individuals uh, Mobile, uh, mobile, or do they get a, to see the picture? Like, I mean, if I'm sending a picture of a, a pothole, do do the the road crew get to see this? I mean, it comes to 311. Do you have the capability of sending that to the road crew or to the uh, bylaw officer? Uh, through the chair, uh, there there is a, there is a manual process. It's not an automated process at this point in time. And what we are doing, because we understand your needs and your wants, we're definitely making sure that that functionality is v available in the very near future. So through the chair. How long will it be before this, uh, this system is active in our, in our system and what do you think the, uh, the cost will be in order to implement this? Uh, through the chair, uh, in regards to the, the, we're looking to have this fully up and running within the next 18 months. And in terms of that cost, that functionality comes along with the solution that we're actually invested in. So for example, when we talked about mobile uh, functionality, that's a turn on, it's free, it's part of the solution. So in terms of that functionality that you're asking for, once it's properly uh, um, um, configured, it's a minimal cost. Okay. Um, through the chair, I know I got a minute and a half. Are we still using Kronos for some of our uh, um, crews out there, for some of our uh, paid staff and, and some of our applications? Through the chair, yes we are, Councillor. Is the problem with EMS being uh, finalized or are they still having problems swiping on, swiping off, uh, configuring uh, who's sent where, uh, so we don't have like an hour and a half of wait uh, in dispatching uh, EMS in a situation where an 80-year-old fell on the ground. And was, this was not long ago and broke her hip. Have we m finalized those uh, operations or are we still back in the Stone Ages through the chair? And I apologize for using the word Stone Age, but if you have a, an hour and a half wait when you broke your hip and you're waiting for an ambulance, that's certainly a concern. Through the chair, um, councillor, most of these issues are resolved and we don't have those issues as we understand. We are continuing to work with Toronto Paramedic Services to uh, further improve and provide additional capabilities to them. When was the last time that we had such a hiccup where somebody was waiting an hour? Uh, through the chair, uh, councillor, as far as I know, in the last six to eight months, we, I have not heard any hiccups uh, coming through the Toronto Paramedic Services. Would you be surprised if I was to tell you it was this winter? S um, through the chair, can you repeat that question, councillor? Would you be surprised if I was to tell you this was a couple of weeks ago? Uh, I would be very surprised, uh, councillor. Would you be surprised if I was to tell you that I was out on the road with EMS last week and they were still facing problems? I would be very surprised, uh, Councillor, but I will reach back to Toronto Paramedic Services again this week and understand whether they are still facing those issues. Given um, we have regular conversations and regular calls with them in regards to this overall implementation. One final question. When was the last time that you spoke to the union reps about this difficulty? 
through the chair, uh, the conversation with union is uh, predominantly through the paramedic services. I can get that answer to you following my discussions with them. I'd like to know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Councilor. Councilor Holliday. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, through the, to the presenters. Um, this presentation is predominantly what you would expect from a government, from many governments, very internally focused. Some of the questions that have come up today and some of the things that we've seen at Council are externally focused. So Wi-Fi in a park, um, 5G in the city, um, looking at big data that we may glean from, say, ride-sharing companies. Um, where are we in your strategy or in your approach to a digital government um, considering government as a utility? So again, back to this, this is about our business, this strategy, and this is about our interactions with citizens. But to me, there seems to be a growing push to be uh, become a utility service, to provide something to do with information technology out there, external to what we do. How does that fit into the sphere of planning that you have? Th thanks for the question. Through the chair, um, context setting. Uh, this presentation uh, initiated by, by the chair was to give um, an awareness of what divisional units do within the city. So, so predominantly, that's what we do. Y your question, um, great question, and I would organize it in a couple uh, this way. We have the function of delivering traditional IT services. We have, so we have the adoption of technology and data within city government. We then also have the enablement of technology within the geographical city. The enablement is through things like open data, shall we say making and creating an open and more transparent government. We have an enablement through our broadband assessment study where we did a study to see if that the uh, access, availability and affordability of broadband, what is the coverage for the city of Toronto. So that's the enablement. And then we have the um, broader lens, which would be what I would call our, our smart cities lens, where we're looking at the enablement and the services and products that are out there. How can we make government more as a utility? So we are actually working on a smart cities framework, which will drive a smart cities strategy. Within that smart city strategy, you will see more of the pieces that you just referred to. What we're trying to do is organize it and strategically align it so it can make it, it can be easily understood. So that's where we are right now. Okay, so to, to paraphrase, uh, that's a, another plan outside of what we heard about today. Yes, it and, is. And I can appreciate that. Okay, yes. second question, uh, again, um, perhaps more high level. If I'm a city program area, I don't know, I, I do parks, and I've got an idea. I mean, there's thousands of professionals in this city that I'm sure think every day, I wish there was an app for that. Can you tell me a little bit about the journey that a program area takes to engage with you to develop an idea into a change in technology? Uh, and, and, you know, can you begin a little bit, you know, what supports do you have from, let's say, even a business analytics, just helping them organize themselves, even if it's on a piece of paper, um, to set themselves up for an idea or an implementation of an IT system? And, and I don't want to get into, you know, they have to go out and get funding and approvals for that, but. But how are you as an internal service and an enabler, right from day one, right up until the end, uh, the end of sustaining those applications? Because I'm convinced there's ideas out there, it's just making them happen is the real issue. Yeah, through the chair, great, great question. And that's predominantly a lot of our world right now. So the channels in would either be through myself or members of my leadership team. We also have, uh, customer relationship managers that work with the various divisions. And that's actually a real, real live example. So we have areas like uh, blockchain technologies, artificial intelligence, mobile apps, et cetera, where people have really good ideas. And the process we take is we ideate together. Um, we have business uh, transformation specialists within our unit, business analysts. And what we try to do is flush it out and with a focus on making sure that we can identify the value that will be delivered to the city first, um, rather than just rushing out and implementing technology. And so that becomes an iterative process with the subject matter experts across the city, not just IT, but we have a lot of expertise and great ideas across the organization and try to get the, the, the good ideas, big ideas to percolate to the top. In general, that's how we do it. How aggressive is the push to get 
an IT analyst or a business analyst out to one of the divisions of the program areas, you know, in the wake of a council direction or some big change that we just did, uh, you know, and, and recognizing that, you know, the, the program area is struggling and scrambling to try to readjust or make something change, how, how, how hard do you push to have one of your people put into the team? Uh, so to help them as a, as a client of yours, I guess, to, to work their way through that process. So through the chair, the city has recently implemented corporate governance around its major themes and focus areas with the deputy city manager, CFO, and city manager assigned to each one of those areas. They're looking for the, let's call it the big opportunities. As they flush out the big opportunities, we're getting engaged that way. That's relatively new, that governance model, as in really, really this year, end of last year. Um, and then the other part is by just working with divisions, division heads or senior leadership when we're called upon. We typically wait um, until the need is identified because otherwise we have what we would call competing priorities. Sometimes, um, and it's not, it, it just has to do with readiness. If it's not, if uh, the business unit, it's not a priority, then it's difficult to kind of drive something like that. So we do it in collaboration and partnership to identify those priorities within the overall corporate priorities, which is through our corporate governance. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Holliday and Councillor Fillion. First of all, thank you for your uh, enthusiasm. Um, I wanted to ask about cyber attack and uh, without revealing anything that might um, assist any would-be attackers, can you just kind of summarize our readiness? Yeah, absolutely. Through the chair, uh, Councillor, uh, in 2018, we actually had um, two Auditor General um, audit reports as it relates to the city's vulnerability assessment. The vulnerability assessment uh, was phase one and phase two. Uh, phase one is what we would call perimeter uh, protection. And so we did an audit report on our perimeter protection. And that's basically, if you can think of a, a gated community, the first level of defense is like a gate. <laughs> you know, and some gate, you've got to be able to get into the community. Um, and so we have recommendations that came out of that. Our phase two was within the organization. Uh, I'm going to speak generically, obviously. Um, industry statistics, this is not new, show that the greatest risk, cyber risk to organization is no longer just the perimeter. It's 60% um, of the people in this room. And what I mean by 60% of the people in this room, it's people who have already access to the network, and if they don't have the education and the awareness, an email comes in, they click on something, creates an exposure, they plug in something they shouldn't plug in. So we had both of those uh, uh, re uh, auditor general recommendation reports. Some recommendations have come out of that. We've been working on it. Um, our posture has been, um, I would say, uh, pretty strong in terms of we've been able to fend off millions of, let's call it attacks, um, and um, we are continuing to build upon that posture is probably the best way to, for me to put it. Thank you. Well, I will, I will go back and uh, read those um, reports and then perhaps follow up on where we are with uh, the recommendations. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Councillor Nunziata, questions? Just a question. Um, so, councillors in, in their ward, and now that it's bigger, there's more districts. So we have districts, like communities within our, within our ward. So we have emails of constituents. And so, for example, if we want to, if there's a public meeting that's happening or something in that particular community, why, why can't we have access that we just send emails to everyone within that, uh, that community, other than we have to send it to the whole ward? That's the only way you can communicate if you send it to the whole ward. Mm -hmm. But if you want to just target different communities, a notification of meetings or what's happening in the community, we're not able to do that. Uh, through, the, through the chair, yeah. councillor. If you know what I mean? I understand your okay. question. Right. I, I'm not as uh, hands-on with that particular application, but I think I'm gonna, if, if I may suggest, similar to uh, Councillor Matlow's request, there seems to be some um, enhancements that would simplify. I may, I may for us, uh, uh, 
Because if you want to just send a, a notice for a meeting in a particular area of your ward, you have to send it to everyone. Understood. You, you can't just send it to a community. I, I find that difficult. I don't know if other members of council see that, but I do. Anyway, thanks. Understood. So through the chair, just quickly on that, I mean, again, uh, the chair, Councillor Ainsley, has brought some of these. What we'll do is maybe we can work together on summarizing some of these um, requests that have come forward and see if we could move them forward through through your office, if you don't mind. Yeah. All right. Ready more count questions, Councillor Nunzia? No. Okay. Land Sixty-seven percent. That's okay. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> um, so I think everybody has asked their questions. So, Mr. Meikle, if I could, I just wanted to ask one. It's yes. kind of a large, all-encompassing one, based on a lot of the questions you've heard today. Um, what do you think your biggest roadblocks are? Is it funding, um, bylaws? Because I know we've talked before about issues around, and maybe Councillor Holliday's here. He's also chairs the Governance Committee. We've talked about, um, like, open data, for example, um, not being able to get some of the agencies on board because while we have members on their board of directors, we don't have a lot of jurisdiction over them. So I just wanted to get some feedback from you about what you thought some of your biggest roadblocks could be or are. Thank you, uh, Councillor and Chair, for that question. Um, so I'll probably put in an, um, maybe a couple of categories. I think one of the opportunities or challenges that we have is that as we move down this road of modernization, innovation, transformation, um, a recognition that um, the technology and data can only do so much, um, and that we also, we also need to be relentlessly focused on modernizing some of our policies and procedures. Um, the authority, uh, uh, the capability and the authority to be very agile, um, I don't think we've, we're, we've matched the two. The appetite for innovation and transformation is clear by the questions, clear by just engaging with constituents, but we need to look at how can we modernize um, some of our practices that way. The world has changed. That's why I gave the statistic on the mobile devices, right? And there's more mobile devices in homes than there are landlines. So the world has changed, and so we've got to look at perhaps changing some of our policies. Secondly, I think that, um, and I know the administration, under our senior leadership team, city manager and deputy city manager, CFO, um, I think we need to create more authority for innovation. And when I say innovation, in speaking with my North American peers, um, with cities obviously not as large as Toronto, uh, we need to be able to create, uh, I'm gonna use the term, I call it like a sandbox, the ability for more piloting trials so that we can quickly test out, vet out um, technologies uh, without necessarily going through the same process in implementing an enterprise-wide system. So we, we, I think there's an opportunity to look at how we can speed up the pipeline in terms of identifying, trialing opportunities um, <clears throat> for the city. And the third challenge that I would put in there is uh, the organization's capacity to adapt all of this change. We have a lot of change that's happening in the city. Um, there's a lot of pressure. We're just wrapping up the budget process. There's a lot of pressure to simplify, drive efficiencies, look for automa automation, and a lot of that is turning to technology. And the organization can only digest a certain amount of change at the same time. And so when you have a lot of enterprise and also functional change going on, it, 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 that is a challenge. So you have to sequence things um, in the right order. I like to compare it to living in the house while you're going through a major renovation, right? You need to, you still need to maintain some level of base functionality. Um, and that's what we're facing at the city. We're going through rapid change um, all at the same time and trying to manage all of that is, is a challenge too. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for an excellent presentation. And then we have, so we have three deputations on this item. 
Our, uh, the first one is Lewis Wynn Jones from Think da Data Works. Mr. Wynn Jones, do you need help hooking things up? Or? No, no, I'm just going to be You're good. All right. Thank you, Councillor. Um, you have five minutes uh, whenever you're ready. There's a clock over there on the wall that you can track your time. Wonderful. Cheers. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of Think Data Works. We're a Toronto-based uh, open data company that uses open data as a core element of our business. Um, a year ago, I defended the establishment of the Open Data Master Plan as I believed it has the potential to elevate Toronto to become the preeminent uh, open city in North America. In the time since that Open Data Master Plan was launched, we have witnessed like seismic changes in the open data landscape um, and a renewed global interest in the economic incentives of making data public. Um, I believe we would not have been prepared to uh, evolve alongside these developments without this well-established open data framework in place. Um, the, municipal the municipalities that are developing strong policy around open data are not only better positioned uh, for the digital requirements of a modern city, they are putting themselves ahead of the curve and unlocking value early. Uh, Toronto has the opportunity to join and surpass cities like New York, San Francisco, Boston's already been mentioned, Seattle, some of the most advanced tech cities in the world, and it should be noted some of the most open, uh, like open data focused cities in North America. Um, we have the opportunity to match them in technological readiness. It's really easy to get lost in the hard questions we're currently facing about the establishment of agile policy frameworks that adequately codify the aggregation and release of public data. I'm not going to. Instead, I'm going to take my time here this morning to just briefly discuss how open data has created an environment that enabled our company to grow to over 30 employees in four years um, and work with some of the largest organizations in Canada, including the federal government. Uh, we are Canadian success story built on the back of open data. We chose to do this here because Toronto is one of the most exciting, dynamic, and important tech hubs in the world. Uh, when we first started speaking to businesses about open data five years ago, uh, we had to explain what it was and why it was important. Uh, a lack of universal best practices and standards made it difficult for a lot of businesses to recognize the value of open data and recognize the value of data that existed outside of their organization. Um, these days, to put that in perspective, there are entire divisions at enterprise organizations devoted to gathering and leveraging useful public data. Uh, when businesses use this data, they gain a competitive advantage in the market. This opens up a greater desire for data, which in turn provides more incentive for governments and organizations that have access to it to release it. Um, our company helps connect organizations to the data they want to use, uh, acting as a bridge between the people who have data and the people who want to use it. As more data is released, there's more data for people to connect to, which means that uh, which means that more problems can be addressed, which means that the appetite for this new resource go up. It sort of is, keeps moving forward. As cities like Toronto release data with greater frequency, we see an immediate spike in market interest in the data they're making public. This has a twofold effect. Uh, one, the cities that are releasing data start seeing people and businesses, businesses innovate on this data. They start building things that either make money, save money, or improve quality of life, or all three. And we as a company are able to grow and give back to the community that made our business possible. Leaving aside the fact that governments themselves will be able to use this data to make better policy decisions, uh, reduce redundancy, and achieve unprecedented transparency, the financial incentives for the release of open data cannot be ignored. Um, countries all over the world are seeing the financial gains of doing this. The Globe and Mail recently wrote a, a piece that noted that every dollar New Zealand puts into its census generates a net value of $5 for the national economy. Um, in Britain, the data held in the public sector and released to businesses and individuals is worth more than $8.5 billion a year in innovation. Um, and beyond that, there's also tangible benefits for small businesses in the enterprise. I'd like to reiterate the fact that in a very small period of time, our company has grown our client base and our presence in Canada. We doubled in size this year, um, and we continue to provide an environment where we foster personal and professional growth for all of our 30-plus employees, 35 now. Um, Lastly, I'd like to note that we are the beneficiary of highly skilled and talented people who are entering this country. Um, the tech landscape in Canada and our digital infrastructure specifically is immeasurably boosted by the fact that we've made Canada an in attractive place to live and work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, questions? I saw Councillor Karagiannis. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Chair, and, and really appreciate the, to the deputy for coming to, to speak to us. Uh, I guess um, you're here telling us about the success of your company. Would that be correct? It, well, the success of open data generally and the sex, success of our company, which is intertwined with uh, Toronto's open data policy. Uh, would the City of Toronto be something that, would, would the City of Toronto be able to utilize some of the resources that your company provides? Well, the City of Toronto should be using the open data that the, the City provides, which is what we use. Um, what we do is we aggregate and distribute the data from every municipality in North America, so not just Toronto, but I believe very strongly that governments should use the city that they have, the data that they have at their disposal. Let me put, a, put it another way. Is there services that you can provide the City of Toronto in order to help us reach there? Absolutely. Now, you said that you work with the Federal Government of Canada. Mm -hmm. What division? Uh, which ministry and what did you do for them? Uh, the TBS, uh, the, uh, so we started working TBS? with uh, the Treasury Board Secretariat, sorry. Okay. Um, the CIOB, which is the, that's an acronym that I always forget. Um, but uh, we started working with the Chief Innovation Officer of the federal government um, because they wanted to have a better picture of government spending overall. Um, when we started working with them three years ago, Basically, uh, the way that it works is every department was releasing their procurement data in different places, in different formats. Um, each procurement contract was released as a separate, separate HTML web page, and it's very difficult to gain an overarching view of, uh, of government spending. How much was that contract worth, if you, if you might share with us? Um, I can't disclose exact figures. I'm not, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Was it one division, two divisions, three divisions? Uh, a long time contract? Oh, sorry, it's, one time it was, uh, I think it was 80% of the division, so something like 78 eight, government departments. 78 federal government departments that your company worked with? Uh, we were pulling down the data from 78 okay. departments. Thank we were you. working with one department. Appreciate it. Yeah. Good. Councillor Holliday. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you had mentioned you looked at open data in other cities, other jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen anyone charge for the data? And even, maybe you know, it's only one certain type that has a high value. Uh, I've seen them try. <laughs> uh, I, I, there are still cities out there that are charging for their data and the result is that people don't use it. Um, even a small amount, it is a barrier to entry that is, even a small barrier is a barrier too high. Why? Uh, why? If it, if it has commercial value, right? So you said companies make a lot of money off of it. Mm -hmm. like if it was a dollar to download it or something. Um, I'm just the, yeah, I mean, I think that that's a, a valid question. Um, the idea behind open data was to unlock it for businesses, but was also to give it to the people who are officially paying for it, which are the citizens. Yeah. Um, so paying for it again seems a bridge too far for a lot of people. Um, I think that there are ways to aggregate data, put it together, and then have a service that can be used but the data itself should be freely available. Okay, and, and do you know, who are, the, who are the people that are taking the data? And it's an interesting point. I mean, if it's the citizens of the city that are downloading it, but potentially these are multinationals, there are companies around the world. That's why there are, are yeah. uh, vigorous open data licenses that you can choose from. So right. you can choose to have it be something that people can't monetize or can monetize on. Um, we, there's Creative Commons licensing, which is right. uh, the one that we sort of adopt as a standard. Um, and I think that that's a good way to control if there's something that you want to sort of keep in-house and keep for citizen transparency and improving quality of life, but not necessarily used by multinationals, then you can apply those licenses. So I see. So it's the concept is, is to use a license rather than hide the data or secure it, make it available, but you would be in a legal territory if you wanted to use it to monetize it in a different way. Yep, that's absolutely an option. And I guess philosophically, as somebody that's involved in business, um, if you knew that if you paid a license fee for it, because you're making lots of money off of it, and that license fee went back into the data system to bring more opportunity of open data, is that something that you think business would be receptive to? Potentially. I think that anything that uh, can augment the digital infrastructure of a city is a good thing. I think that um, most businesses are just trying to do their job and uh, and sort of if, if you can use something that is a natural resource in the city uh, for free, then that is good. Um, but I, I think that there are people who would be interested in doing something like that. Thank you for your candor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Matlow, do you have any questions? No? Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, where do you think we should go next as a city with open data? 
Yeah, I think that, uh, thank you for the question. I think that's a good one. Um, when we started out releasing open data, the, the real thing that everyone pushed for was numbers. Let's push out more data, more data, more data. And um, quantity is not the question here. Quality of the data is imperative. So um, we also we see a lot of open data portals actually shrink in size, but uh, heighten the overall quality of the data. Um, I think now that we understand what drives value, releasing more data is the benefit. The more data that's out there in the ecosystem, the more people can innovate on it. Um, the cities that are falling behind in this are not iterating on their policy. Toronto is has established themselves at the, the forefront of this, and I, th I firmly believe that next year we will finally surpass Edmonton as the best open data portal and best open data city um, because of our iterative approach. Um, so just never sort of taking our foot off the gas, really. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming in this morning. Cheers. Uh, our next deputy is Jennifer Evans from Tech Reset Canada. Good morning, Ms. Evans. You have five minutes to address the committee. Uh, there's a clock over on the wall so you can keep an eye on your time and uh, you can start whenever you're ready. Thank you and good morning, everyone. My name is Jen Evans. I'm an entrepreneur. My company's product, which I invented, was recently ranked as one of the top five marketing analytics platforms in the world. We're lucky to have customers in five countries, including HP, Citrix, SAP, and Dell. We also worked with several candidates, counselors, and trustees in the last municipal campaign. I'm also an accidental but passionate homeless activist. Last winter, Mohammed Fakih of Paramount Foods fame and I worked together to house homeless in hotels during the cold snap, and since then we've gone on to work together to financially support residents in insecure housing at 650 Parliament and across St. Jamestown. I'm also a co-founder of Tech Reset Canada with Bianca Wiley, Sadia Muzaffar, and April Dunford. We have been closely watching and opining on the evolution of the Sidewalk Labs project. We are active in a few areas, and homelessness is the issue I am most passionate about. I've personally started working with Starbucks to redirect leftover food to Tent City and joined the board of Seeds of Hope Charity. And it makes little sense to me and others that I work with that a city this wealthy can't afford to look after its most needy. I live on the waterfront and interact with vulnerable people there every day. There's a connection between lack of open data and homelessness. Ironically, lack of data is part of the problem despite the fact that we live in a data-saturated environment. The need for good data in this area is critical to effectiveness. After yet another difficult winter, it's not only apparent we do not have enough shelter beds, but the shelter beds are not sufficient, and we don't have the tech to effectively track what is happening. For example, when, for example, one shelter is run off a single cell phone. Without data, we can't help people who deserve stability and dignity. What we are doing now, manual counting every couple of years, is not effective. People deserve and need a safe place to sleep at night and enough to eat and hope for the future, and we need the means to help them. Apps for the homeless, while well-intentioned, are really not the answer as they're currently designed and demonstrate a lack, of understanding, a lack of understanding of the challenges of that community. Without data, we can do little. There's an opportunity for us to be a truly data-informed, note I did not say data-driven, city. There are two parallel priorities for any government, economic advancement and taking care of the most vulnerable in our society. We're clearly succeeding right now at the former but our commitment to the latter is not keeping up. If we had better data and more access to open data, the techies in this city would go to town on it. We've seen the power of that community at work like this in the past for uh, things like transit camp and others. It would make it possible to do so much more with the resources we have, deploying them more intelligently. So I and Tech Reset Canada support two things we view as critical to this the appointment of a chief analytics officer, and an open data policy that allows us to advance economically while better looking after those who have fallen on hard times and cannot look after themselves. We need to design open data solutions around the needs of these communities with their input and need a strategy for the management of that data that does not currently exist in this city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions of the deputy? Sure. Councillor Holliday. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you intrigued me because I, I remember placing a motion um, during some of the respite center debates around this. And, you know, you know like the thinking, it's, it's really you know, simple stuff, but just 
you know, the concept of can you match people to spaces to go and, you know, where are those spaces? But you've obviously given this some thought. Um, what's the type of raw data you think should be gleaned to be put into a system? I mean, you talked about Chief Analytics Officer and some recommendations, but I'm just right at the basics here. Sure. What are the kind of things that need to be gathered that could be put into the funnel and somebody can figure out how to better use? From what I've been able to glean, we really have not ever consulted the homeless themselves on the kinds of solutions that would work for them. So we do a, a reasonably effective job at counting how many people are actually currently in homeless uh, situations, who's insecure uh, from a housing perspective. But the challenge is that these numbers change constantly. When you have an incident like uh, what's happened in St. Jamestown, you suddenly have thousands of people who are in an insecure housing situation. Um, and the reality is that we have never really consulted, surveyed, talked to the people themselves who are impacted about the kinds of solutions that they would like. And as an example, uh, I know lots of, of people who are in this situation who would far prefer to stay out in minus 20 degree weather than go to one of the existing shelter solutions right now because they fear for their safety, there's theft, there's violence. Um, and we are totally uninformed about what kinds of solutions would actually work for people who are in these situations. To me, that's a data point that we need to collect um, that could possibly change the way that we handle the situation completely. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Other questions of the deputy? No. I have a couple. Um, could you touch a little bit more on the, your campaign for digital rights now? Yes, so uh, we are working on a, a slate of rights for citizens when it comes to the handling of their personal data, um, both at a municipal level and when it comes to the, the uh, use of that data in corporations. Um, this is a really challenging environment and challenging situation given that there are so many intersections of how the data is collected, used, and, uh, and maintained. And what that has often taken out of the equation is the rights of the individual to own their own data. Um, there are initiatives underway where people can now sell their data to corporations rather than it being used without their permission. And so uh, Digital Rights Now is really a movement toward the idea that we do have rights when it comes to the collection and maintenance of our own data um, and giving us some autonomy in how that is managed. Okay. Thank you. And then I just wanted to ask you, I was looking at your website. Um, the one comment or the one paragraph uh, where it says we believe in, it says addressing the yawning tech gap between private and public sectors. Public, public servants do not have the tools they need to do their jobs. Government, infra government tech infrastructure is in crisis. Addressing this must be prioritized adjacent to investing in private sector growth. Could you comment on that, by what you mean, the yawning gap and the crisis you see? Um, I think we can use the federal government's experience with Phoenix, um, the fact that in the provincial government we have people working off laptops that are running 10-year-old technology. These are not effective ways uh, to uh, advance the technology agenda. Um, if our government doesn't have the tools that it needs to be able to do things like process payroll effectively. Um, we need public servants. I, I had a conversation, this is just purely anecdotal, but I was on a via rail train one day talking to a public servant who was sharing a laptop. Uh, she was a provincial government employee with another employee because they did not have the funding to replace hers. So they had two people sharing one laptop trying to get work done um, on a shared basis. And this is endemic, we, we see it everywhere. Uh, the reality is that most of the institutional knowledge around technology resides in the private sector and is not necessarily shared, deployed as uh, effectively in the public sector. And that's a real priority for us because there's a lot of waste that's happening. Okay, all right. Any other questions for the deputy? No, thank you very much for coming in this morning. Thank you. And our last deputy on this item is uh, Mark J. Richardson, housingnowto.com. Morning, Mr. Richardson. I think you know how it goes here, so do you whenever you're ready to here? start. Mm, we can see that okay.
All right, so uh, councillors, I'm Mark Richardson from Housing Now TO uh, to speak on delivering digital government. Uh, I added an extra line in there, which is digital, delivering digital government like our global peers. I um, want to send you a, a warm welcome from all the folks who were down at the New York City School of Data this weekend on Saturday. Um, I was down there with a number of other people from the city, of, uh, from Toronto. Um, we were there with the chief analytics officer, the chief technology officer, mayoral staff, and three New York City councillors, plus 400 plus uh, advocates for open data and civic technology. The sign behind them is very important. It says, happy birthday, New York City open data law. Uh, it's a law. It's not a, uh, a policy. It's not a master plan. It's an actual law in New York City. Uh, New York City's data school is run by uh, Beta NYC. Their mandate is to envision an informed and empowered public that can leverage civic design, technology, and data to hold government accountable and to improve their op economic opportunity. So in 2012, Mayor Mike Bloomberg signed their open data law into power. In 2016 and 2017, Mayor de Blasio created open data compliance plans for all their divisions, departments, and agencies. In addition, in 2017, they formalized the chief analytics, uh, data, uh, mayor's office of data analytics was added into the city charter, which is like writing it into the city of Toronto act. Uh, and that's really, I mean, I'm, you know, there were some very hard questions for your CIO today. And essentially your CIO is trying to do most of this stuff with one arm tied behind his back because you haven't given him any carrot or any stick to deliver on these uh, requirements. I'm uh, going to very quickly show this, uh, this video from New York City because uh, it has some interesting yellow bubbles in it, which I think is uh, important to see. How do you keep a city of 8 million people effective, efficient, and on its feet? Open data is part of the approach. Every time you call 311, apply for a construction permit, or ride in a yellow cab, you're contributing to the creation of public data. You're also seeing your government at work. Data sets collected by city agencies keep your government moving at the pace of the people it serves. NYC Open Data is the city initiative to put this data back in your hands. Every day, New Yorkers use open data to advocate for their communities, build their businesses, and hold their elected officials accountable. The city is yours to analyze. Start exploring at nyc.gov data. So a bunch of those yellow buttons that popped up were really interesting because they're things we don't do here in the city of Toronto. Um, there were bubbles for bike share data, for parking information, for third parties like Ubers and taxis. You guys enter into RFPs with companies and you don't bake into your RFPs. They have to give you data that you can release publicly as part of that agreement. Um, I posted a blog after the data school this weekend called Open Data for Wicked Problems. Uh, it talks a little bit about the stuff that uh, Jen was talking about from a, a shelter and housing point of view. How do we focus our open data deliverables on the hard problems of the city, not the easy stuff? Specifically, there's a couple of things that have come up in the last year or so that I thought you might be interested in from the New York City example. So uh, HeatSeek. New York, we've been working with them, some of the folks in the lo local open data community. For people who have problems with apartment buildings, bad landlords, where the apartments are too hot in the summertime and too cold in the wintertime, there's a brutal paperwork process to actually file a claim. Putting a sensor like this into the apartments lets you create an automated record once every hour, shows you what the average temperature was, how many hours that unit was in violation. Uh, we have some of these and we're going to be working with some of the local groups here in Toronto to get those into some of your actual problematic apartments. Some of you were talking about 311. There's Reported NYC, which is a open data interface to their 311 system. Lets people report bicycle lanes being blocked by taxis, uh, by armored vehicles, by paper shredding trucks. Um, Somebody's always going to ask, how do we pay for it? Councillor Holliday might ask that question. Last year, by putting this into the hands of the citizens of New York City, the citizens issued $380,000 worth U.S. of tickets. 
for violations. So you found half a million dollars you weren't going to get, and it didn't cost you anything in order to do that. The uh, last one here is one we've done here locally, which is the Housing Now TO program. Uh, so when the mayor announced Housing Now TO, we scraped data, some of it out of your open data system, but also out of the City Council TMIS system, uh, the uh, TTC, uh, Toronto Parking Authority, and uh, Metrolinx Eglinton Crosstown. We ran that through uh, Map Your Property with some tools from the Evergreen Foundation, and we worked with the Ryerson Planning students. And we've created a public map. We were somewhat inspired by Councillor Matlow's map that he has on his site, which tracks development in his ward. So now we have a public map that is free, interactive, that tracks all of these Housing Now sites with their details. We launched it in January. We've had over 6,000 hits on the site since we launched it. Uh, and the, probably the most interesting thing is that most of our traffic comes from inside City Hall, CreateTO, TCHC, and your own networks. Your staff are using it rather than digging through your staff reports. The cost of this was about 30 volunteer person hours and hard cost of about $100. Um, after property was there, we also created uh, the one sheet version of it so that you're not having to dig through a bunch of staff reports to find your stats. If you want to know about Housing Now TO, you can use our one sheet system. Uh, and that's available on our website to anybody to look at. And it uses your staff numbers. It just puts them all into a single place. Uh, you were asking for what we need to do as the City of Toronto to back, catch up with our global peers. You've got three choices. Uh, lead follow or get out of the way. Uh, you're not leading because you're seven years behind where New York was when it comes to giving your CIO a legal mandate to do this stuff. You're barely following at the moment, so people are working around you. We're doing stuff like the Housing Now TO system uh, in order to deliver what the people want. Uh, we'd rather do it with you than without you, but that's unfortunately not way, the way things are at the moment. And that's my time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. Right on time, exactly. Uh, Councillor Matlow, you're first. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, you know, what, what, you did, what you just did is exactly what I wish would happen when, whether it be councillors or the mayor, uh, go on these kind of trips and, and for, you know, for pre professional development and learning best practices and then come back and share in a detailed form what you've learned, because I, I found that really interesting through your experience at the uh, the data school that you went to in New York. Um, and so you held up uh, one of those heat sensors yep. uh, that they use in New York. And so as you know, I've been you know actively uh, involved in advocating for uh, better policy here to be able to protect tenants. Could you describe, uh, did, you, did you learn much more than what you shared with us about how that's used and then how the city is able to respond and then uh, ensure that those tenants are taken uh, care of? Yeah, so these are not funded by the city. This is a not-for-profit in, in the states which works in relation with like the Tenants Union and ACORN and some other associations. But they are, a, a, these are 3D printed boxes with custom chips inside, um, custom sensors, uh, and they work off a cheap Wi-Fi network or a cheap cellular network, which is unfortunately something we don't have a lot of here in Canada. Yes. Um, the data gets uploaded to the cloud. Uh, the unit number is disassociated in, when it's loaded into the cloud, so we can't tell it's <clears throat> this individual until we match it in a secure site later on. So every hour it takes a temperature reading, that temperature reading is loaded up to the cloud and it will fill in the forms. There's, a, there's actually something called the tenant court in New York City yeah. and you have to fill out a very specific form with a log of your temperatures, which is hard to do if people are working shift and stuff like that. So this automates that uh, documentation process and uh, and then can be submitted to the court to prove that there is a violation for more than six hours or whatever it is before the, an enforcement action can take place. And, and is that information then available through open data to websites like Rent Logic yep. and others? Yeah, so Rent Logic was actually, uh, Rent Logic, I mean, Rent Logic. Was Yale, was Yale, at, was so, yeah, Yale there? Yeah, so yeah. Rent Logic is a classic story, yeah. right? Yale is from Toronto. Yeah, yeah. Yale had to go to New York City to do what he's doing because the data was in New York. You fish where the fish are. Uh -huh. And the data was not available here. There was not the institutional support for the work he was doing. So instead, he's building a company 
in New York City rather than building it in Toronto. This is why, to uh, Councillor Holliday's question earlier, why you make this data freely available. It's you, you fish where the fish are, and you've got to make sure that you make this, uh, this content available to everybody to use. We always talk about, like in Toronto, we always talk about wanting to be like New York and like Chicago and like all these amazing cities around us. Um, uh, often that, you know, the rhetoric is, is strong, the actions don't always follow. From your experience with uh, what you learned in New York, uh, can you recommend uh, what are some basic steps that our city government can take to, uh, to emulate the best practices of a city like New York with respect to open data and, and then also, you know, supporting, supporting residents to, to have access to it. I, I think you can go back and look at presentations we've given to this committee over the last three years. It is not making your employees do this off the side of their desks. It is having, treat this like a Y2K problem. Y2K, you set a deadline, you had to have it fixed by. There was a standalone budget, and every division in the city had access to that budget to fix their Y2K problem. You have an open data problem. Set a 2021 date. By 2021, every division has to release this amount of open data, and it's based on these high value priorities. There's a central pool of money. The CIO or somebody else has both a carrot and a stick and you make the various divisions, uh, you, you judge their managers and their directors on their, this is a delivery metric in the same way you did with gender equity and employment. People aren't gonna do this voluntarily. They're, it's a, they're happy with the opaque systems. They don't have the funding to do this by themselves. Uh, if, you, if you give them a, a centralized fund they can draw from and a deadline and you enforce both of those things, then you'll catch up. That's what New York City did, that's what Chicago did, that's what San Francisco and Seattle have done. I really appreciate you taking the time to present to us today and share your, your experience and, and your advice. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Matlow. Uh, Councillor Holliday. Thanks, Chair. Um, you put it out there, you put the money out there. Um, I wanna know if, how we can make money off of this. And I, I mean that in a nice way. I, you did bring up the issue of enforcement, and I'm quite intrigued by that. We know that uh, some of the transfer ta transformation that's going on with Toronto Police is shifting enforcement uh, further and further to our bylaw officers. You know, noise has been in the news a lot lately. Um, there's all sorts of human conflict in this city, and you've intrigued me. You showed some examples where it looks like tickets were issued based on inputs on citizens, by citizens, sorry, could you tell me a little more about how that works and, and where you could see that going? And uh, you know, I start out with the money, and maybe the money's helpful to pay for the infrastructure, but what we're really talking about is citizens and their confidence in government, and you know, how can this go to support that? Well, I mean, first of all, releasing budget information in an open state so that it could be tracked year to year, uh, that we can compare like to like year to year, certainly one. That reported New York City example that we talked about, uh, they, the citizens were able to generate half a million Canadian dollars in tickets. Um, what is your time worth? I've heard most of you around this table today talk about going back and asking staff for the same 311 information over and over and over again. How much is, does it cost in your time, your staff's time, 311 staff's time? How much time gets wasted in planning, create TO and council meetings, having staff explain the chart on page 42 of some staff report, rather than making that information available. We, when we did the Housing Now TO site, we designed it so that a grade four or five student could use it for their social studies homework without assistance. And I think that's where we need to be targeting the information consumption the easier you make this information consumption, you're going to find savings from those efficiencies. The current processes you have are incredibly inefficient and burn a lot of money under the covers. Could you go a little further though on the, the example that you provided in the, the presentation on how the citizens were supporting the ticketing of illegal behaviors. Yeah, so it's on the screen here. Uh, it's an app, it's available on uh, your Android or your Apple devices. Uh, you can go in and there are certain types of violations. 
within the laws, the bylaws, yep. that can be enforced based on citizen-delivered evidence. So bylaw changes or structural changes Some by the city. Structural changes or, or maybe there's just, so there are things like blocking a crosswalk, mm -hmm. blocking a bike lane, uh, certain kinds of violation. I think you actually have one in the city now for reporting graffiti violations. Yeah, the city you know, of Toronto has one. C-click fix, I mean, there's all yeah. sorts of things so out there. So in, in this particular case, there's a series of violations. They didn't rewrite their 311 page. This is an outside developer who created the application that submits your ticket to 311 using all their formatting because the, the government site wasn't very easy to manage. So what they did instead was they created this application which lets any average New Yorker submit a one of these sample uh, problems within 30 seconds by right. filling in a quick form. So outside service provider packages the information, goes over to the city. Uh, outside service provider, but it's a volunteer civic tech person. It is not a vendor, oh, okay. in your mind. And and so this this uh, data package comes over to the city. It's got a picture. It's got some GPS data, some it's information into about your it. One system. City writes a ticket, sends it to uh, the vehicle owner, I guess, by plate, plate owner. or yep. whatever it is. Yep. Uh, and I presume that probably saved a whole lot of staff time and people were happy because tickets were getting written. And the citizens feel empowered. The right. citizens feel that... That's the piece. They're, they're, they're getting somewhere, that when I'm walking through the crosswalk and there's an armored car in front of me, Brinks is going to get in trouble. And that's, that's part of it. Part of the distrust that we have is we call 311 and we get told it's going to be three weeks for us to get back sure. to you. Or they're inundated and yeah. this maybe is a way to help. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Holliday. Other questions of the deputy? Seeing none. Thank you very much, Mr. Richardson. Really appreciate you coming in this morning. Uh, questions of staff? Sorry, we already did. Speakers? Councillor Matlow? I, uh, well, first of all, I want to I want to express my appreciation to uh, to Rob and Gary and everybody uh, uh, on the IT team who are um, are I think doing terrific work with the means that they have, with the abilities that they have, and with the resources they have to uh, uh, make Toronto a genuinely smart city. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge um, our chair, Paul Ainsley, who uh, you know without his enthusiasm and and support for. Uh, really being innovative uh, and sharing open data, uh, I, don't, I don't believe we'd be at the point that we are at today. And this is not just recent, this has been several years of Paul's, Paul's work. Um, but I'm also inspired by people like uh, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and others uh, throughout North America and elsewhere who have uh, provided leadership to be able to ensure that their cities uh, really take action. And I think as was said by somebody don't mind, I'm just in a little trouble uh, just with the conversation behind me, Vince. Um, uh, you know, somebody said, uh, you know, that uh, maybe perhaps it was Mark that, that our staff are working with their hand, you know, one, high, one hand behind their back. If they don't have, uh, you know, the, whether it be policy or laws or clear deadlines, expectations, the full strength of council to be able to do the work that I believe that they really want to do. I mean, that's why they are in this business. So I'd like to see them supported. I, I would like to see uh, Wi-Fi rolled out into public spaces uh, that, uh, that has a sustainable business model, that can improve the environment for small startup tech companies that may not even be able to afford to get into a, to an incubator, but, you know, would like to, you know, pull out a couple laptops at a, at a, at a park bench and, 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 and start a great idea that could turn into a big company. Um, I'd like to see uh, the digital divide uh, uh, combated uh, so that uh, it isn't only people, it aren't, it, it, it's not just the families who can afford a Rogers or Bell bill, but everybody who can access uh, the internet so that they're able to uh, do their homework after school or apply for jobs or what have you, whatever their priorities are. Um, I'd like to see a city that can um, share data to keep us accountable as well with respect to protecting tenants 
uh, who are uh, stuck in, in, in awful uh, 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 rent agreements or their, their buildings are overheated and there's no way for us to be able to ensure that they're getting the service that they need. There are ways in other cities, as we've learned, uh, to be able to provide more support and more service to them. I'd like to see, and I'm very excited what Gary told us, that uh, we might have more of a one-stop shop uh, mobile application that residents can use so that they're not just kind of saying, you know, who's going to do it or where do I go or how do I get that information to them, but have a one-stop shop where they can go to and just send that photo in, click on, click on uh, uh, you know, a button and be able to say, uh, this is my concern, this is my complaint, get the reference number, and then I would hope, and I'm, I'm, maybe I'm going ahead of you and I, I don't know if you've considered this, but I would hope that then you can put that reference number in any time to check on the status of your, wonderful, I mean, it's intuitive, uh, status of your concern so that you know that it's being attended to. Uh, that will give people a lot of peace of mind. And then even if we don't have the resources to do it within the time frame that they would like to see it done, at least they will know that it's actively being pursued and they can sort of take a deep breath and know that it's being worked on. And then if it's not done within a reasonable time frame, at least then they know that they can complain with great validity behind them. Um, if we become a smart city, we become more of a competitive city. We become that world-class city that we talk about in rhetoric. And the cool thing about this, I mean, Councillor Kerry Janice talked about, you know, some of our services being the Stone Age. I was joking with Paul earlier that, you know, back then, fire was like that new innovative tech that people were using. And we've come so far from that time. We are a modern city. But there's so many other, you know, so-called new, new technology uh, um, opportunities that have already been invented. They, they exist. They're all over the world. And all we need to do is borrow from those best practices, learn how to use them in the Toronto context and run with them. And not be afraid to be innovative, pilot, take risks, and use our city as uh, really a, a, a large incubator for innovative ideas, while at the same time, and equally as importantly, ensure that people's data and privacy is protected, <clears throat> and that we have ways to assure individuals that while uh, we want to use data and we want to share it and we want to use technology, that it's for their benefit to create a city that is, can, can provide improved services, not the other way around where the city is just working with corporations to suck information out of individuals to, for other people to make money off them. And that's, I think, where we need to find that balance and make sure that there's public confidence in the work that we do, but also have confidence in our staff to do the work that we've asked them to do. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Matlow. Uh, Councillor Karajanis, I saw your hand. Sure. Go ahead, Councillor Karajanis, I saw your hand first. Thank you, um, thank you, Chair. Really, um, we had an interesting conversation today, and certainly um, um, open data, data services, uh, freedom of information, uh, protecting people's rights. I ask the question, how long does it take to put something on our website uh, in order for people to be able to upload stuff to 311? That was three years ago and I suggested something and it's, you know, three years later we still haven't got it. You will take a guru of a website five minutes to add that application on our website. It is not rocket science. And talking to staff, I'm told that, you know, like somebody can go and take a picture that's inappropriate and we share it. Well, those pictures that we take on the street or somebody uploads and sends to 311, it's not now available to a bylaw officer. So if one of us or anybody sends a picture of a pothole, a picture of a garbage-related material or something that happens to the parks and sends it to 311, 311 does not have the capability, even if they email it as an attachment, 311 does not have the capability of downloading that picture to the bylaw officer. So the bylaw officer gets an address, he or she shows up and, and they're blind, they don't know what they're looking for, or somebody from the park, if there's something that's thrown at the park, they don't know what they're looking for, unless there's a precise description of where it is and where it isn't. A picture is worth a thousand words. So this application has to be sped, sped up. The fact that I'm hearing it's, uh, you know, it's privacy concerns, well, the bylaw officer that's gonna show up 
at the park or the, at the garbage, or if there's something that's racist or something that's inappropriate, the bylaw officer has the capability and the know-how. I mean, we got to trust our people that they know what is inappropriate for them to delete that picture or not to share it with anybody. If somebody wants a copy of that picture, well, they can't get it. I'm told that if you want to report a rooming house, uh, people say I don't want to report it anonymously. And the bylaw officer turns around and says to me that, well, you know, you can share that information with us because we do, we're not going to release this information. So the stuff that I hear from our staff, and it's respectable. However, you can talk to any guru of a website and they will up, be able to allow you to upload the app in five minutes. Now that being number one. Number two, I'm surprised and shocked when I ask the questions of staff about Kronos that not aware, they're not aware of what is happening with EMS. We have people out there that have fallen, and this is recently, there's an 80 year old woman that's fallen, broken her hip on the ice, person calls in, and the 911 operator says to the woman that called in, please stay with her. And the response that the ambulance did was an hour later. This stuff has to stop. The misuse of our, uh, of, our, uh, of our assets because of programs that do not work, and Kronos is not the best of programs. It's got the difficulties like Phoenix. It has to stop, and we have to rise and be responsible. I mean, it shouldn't take a counselor to go out and speak to staff in order for this stuff to be done. It should not take that, but if that's what it takes, then so be it. And this, this situation was brought to the attention of staff a year and a half ago, and it's still a consistent problem. So I have to tell you that unless we fix these things up, not so much about uploading the garbage, but so as much as making sure that Kronos works, there's going to be a major incident. We will not have the ambulances to respond, and then we're going to look flat-footed and irresponsible. Chair, I'll leave that, and I will leave it at this point, and I'm sure staff knows what I'm talking about. Thank you, Councillor Karajanis. Deputy Mayor Holliday. Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you to everyone that spoke and presented today. Um, years ago, uh, some of the work I did, I was involved in studying SEPTA, and that's crime prevention through environmental design. It's all about physical security, but some of the principles were you know, when you approach a place and you see the lighting and you see how neat and tidy the grounds are kept and how the front door looks, it would deter crime because if it was messy, dirty and unkept, a criminal might say, you know, they don't have their act together and may, that may be a good place to rob. And, you know, politicians around the table here, we did a lot of door knocking and I, you know, one of the things I'd always noticed is that you go to so some houses and the front door was well maintained, it looked like the lock worked, there was a doorbell, maybe there was a camera. And, I said, boy, this place is really secure. And then you go to another place and didn't have all that. And you wonder kind of what was going on behind the door. Well, I sort of see our 311 gateway as the same thing. You know, citizens uh, you know, um, approach us for help or they call the city for different things. And they, they are sensing the interaction and how it goes. Um, they know that maybe there's a very limited set of channels in which they can put their input, or once they put the information into there, it, it kind of goes into the, the vortex of the system. Um, and, and this is in no way a, a knock on 311. They're a fantastic service, and they do everything they can with the resources that they've got. But the point here today was some of the discussion about, you know, how do you access the services? How do you use the app to put in the picture? Um, and I, th I think back to that front door theory that in order to instill confidence in people with their interaction with the city, they have to feel good about that interaction and feel that everything is, is built right. And this all goes and gels into some of the IT strategy that was brought before us. Um, that's the why, you know, why should we do this? Well, it's the how that I'm really interested in. We've got a great team um, with, with Rob and, and his team there, and we've got really, really good public servants in the city of Toronto that have really good ideas on how to make things better. You know, I must have heard there must have been, an, you know, there must be an app to do this many, many times. The concern I have, and uh, I heard some positive remarks today, was when a problem is thrown at a business area, and whether they're in parks or water or transportation, um, I'm not sure they get the business support help they need from an IT perspective early on. And that's not a knock to the IT organization. I think the help needs to be asked for. 
I think you need to bring someone into the team really early to start to think about, you know, what is, the, what is it we're trying to do? How is our existing process working? And can we even do this on paper today? And once we get the paper sorted out and the business rules sorted out and the information sorted out, then we go to the technology. We don't jump to that last. It's like bringing an auditor in early on your process to, to understand things early on and build things into, you know, uh, the chief uh, chief privacy the privacy commissioner had privacy by design, right? You bring in somebody early on and start talking about how you develop your solution over time, and I hope there's more of that that happens uh, in this city, um, and and in this public service that we've got is get in early and figure out how how the IT solution can work. And you know, I, I, it was a great example today about getting citizens to try to report bylaw infractions. That you know, maybe that'll take the load off of our bylaw officers if we can make that work. But it can't be about the technical solution, about the camera phone sending the thing in. It needs to be way, way back into the what are our rules? What are our rules around information? Do we have a courage as a council to go try to make changes to those fundamental rules because there's a reason why? What does the legislation say and does that have to be adjusted? You figure all that out early on and then you go through all of the steps to the end solution. And maybe it's this, maybe it's something different. And the last comment I'll make is uh, one thing I am very cognizant about is us trying to be too many things as a city. Um, I still really appreciate the internal focus we've got on our IT and, and maybe a larger focus is now on data and where we, we rest as having data as a public resource. Where I get really cautious is where we start to move as a city as a utility. Um, you know, there was some discussion about providing Wi-Fi in parks and getting into collecting data and different services. You gotta get this part done first. Um, and I think we should think very, very careful if we wanna get into the utility space about being externally focused. I asked that question in this room when we were talking about autonomous vehicles. You know, do I have to be into the big data business in the future? And the answer I got was they weren't really sure. But I'm not sure I want to run a data network to run the streets at this point in time. And I think as a, as a council, we should think carefully about that. And I think citizens should think about what they think their municipal government should be delivering to them and whether or not includes things such as utilities. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Holliday. Other speakers? Seeing none. I'm going to speak last. So I do have a motion that I'm going to put forward uh, that the presentation from Rob Meikle, Chief Information Officer on Information and Technology Delivering Digital Data be distributed to all members of Council for their information. And I know, uh, Rob, I want to thank you first off to yourself and Grant and your team for putting uh, this presentation together. Um, the title of it, I think, says everything, uh, Delivering Digital Government. Um, this is my my third term now as the chair of the Government Management Committee. Um, now it's the Government Licensing Committee. Um, but thinking back to when I was first appointed chair of this committee, how far behind we were in delivering a digital government, uh, not just here, but amongst um, some of our ABCs. And, you know, I do a lot of reading, I do a lot of research. I see import how important it is in delivering digital technology to make sure we have a 21st century functional government. And that's not only delivering services to our residents uh, to make their lives easy, whether it's, you know, going to the library and, uh, you know, so kids can do their homework, uh, living in an apartment building and not worrying about the heat. The one gentleman that talked about uh, heat seek, you know, there's many different applications and areas where a digital government comes into play. Um, and you know, it, it's right across the spectrum of, you know, a young child to a senior citizen trying to register for a recreation program uh, this past Sunday and how easy or, or difficult it, it can be for them. I think, you know, it has many different applications. Uh, we've come a long way. Um, I still think we have, uh, you know, we've got a path. We've got a path laid out. I know we've had meetings uh, with the city manager, um, the deputy city manager, Josie Scioli, that's beside me. Uh, when we talk about where we're taking the next steps forward and modernizing this city, I think we have a path laid out. Uh, when I asked Mr. Meekle about uh, roadblocks, wasn't trying to put him in a difficult position, um, but I still know, you know, as we saw this morning, <laughs> there are roadblocks around uh, funding, you know, you know, you have to go to the budget committee every year 
uh, to put forward a case about what you want to do on the next path, um, the next part of the path forward. Uh, the reason for my motion, uh, you know, there's a number of our colleagues that I still are on that learning curve about what it means to deliver a digital government. I think every little bit of help we can give them putting this presentation in front of them uh, so they understand where we are going as a digi digital government I think is very important. So I want to thank the staff for the work. I want to thank the deputants uh, for coming in. I think it's important to hear from outside of City Hall um, to have that perspective on uh, where they see the challenges are from the city. Um, we got some compliments from some of the deputants on, uh, on where we're going. I think that's important too. I think we are on the right path and uh, I want to thank everybody for their input this morning. Yes, sir. Question for the mover. Um, would you just uh, give some thought as to uh, when distributing to the members of council, just to assure that uh, perhaps there's a, 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 a different media used to be able to uh, deliver it to them, given that some may not be uh, digitally literate. Uh, <laughs> yes, we can do that. Thank you. <laughs> right. Okay. Um, all in favor of the motion? Carried, and I think we're on the next item. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. There we go. My wife has a GPS system on the back of this to keep track of me. Sometimes it flips it around. <laughs> Our next item is uh, number four, amendment to purchase order number 6044338 for Toronto City Hall building envelope improvements. Uh, Councillor Holliday and Councillor Fillion had a joint hold on this. Whoever wants to go first. Um, Questions of staff? Yes, the, um, I'm looking, I'll go right to the um, last page, continuous improvement. Um, the statement is made the project team has shared the lessons learned from this project with all uh, FM project management staff. Um, I think that, if could I get some elaboration on that? What was learned and what would we do differently next time? The, uh, at the last meeting, we had, um, uh, I guess, a similar situation with hazardous materials with the motel on Kingston Road, and there, I think part of the explanation was that it was uh, not our building, and we would have had some difficulty getting access. But this, you know, clearly is our building, so I, I'm just wondering why that. Um, it's great that if we're moving ahead to that, but why would there not have been a proper assessment of hazardous materials? Through the chair, uh, we did look, so we did do our due diligence on, on the facility. We looked at, at previous, uh, all the historical drawings um, that showed where the, the material was. But in certain, and we did do a random selection of removal of, of different panels prior to construction. Um, except where, where the additional uh, hazardous material was, was hidden behind a panel that we couldn't see, or that was not indicated on the drawing. 
and was not um, on the upper floor, so this was sort of isolated to the, to the first, second, and third floors. So we did a replacement program before on the upper floor, so that that wasn't uh, indicated in any of the historical documents that we had. The, uh, my last question is just on, um, in the motion, it talks about the scope changes request, bu requested by Heritage Preservation Services. So I, I, I'm not sure who can answer this, but the question would be why Heritage Preservation Services would make changes. Certainly they would be, like, why, why would, uh, obviously they know it's a heritage building, why would that information not have been available with the initial uh, tender? Um, through the chair, when this, this project was originally tendered, um, Heritage was part of Heritage Preservation Services uh, signed off on all the modifications. There, uh, post tender, there were, were three aspects to the um, uh, to the uh, requested changes and modifications. One had to deal with the um, uh, Chamber Council windows that the original when the mock-ups were, were were presented to uh, and. A, originally approved by uh, Heritage post-construction when we brought forward them again, um, there was a visual impact issue with the, with the, uh, with the uh, mock-ups and we were asked to go back and, and do additional mock-ups to make sure that the historical integrity of the windows uh, was, uh, was uh, maintained. The second aspect of the, of the uh, change had to do with the uh, aluminum panel assembly Again, it was you know pre-approved uh, post uh, pre-tender, and then when we actually uh, started installing them, again uh, the look and feel they felt that um, it didn't match the original um, the original aluminum, so we actually had to then go back and modify those again for you know the first, second, and third floor. Then the third aspect uh, of the of the change has to do with the modifications of the doors. So we'll be replacing approximately 51 doors on the um, around the council chambers and the second and third floors. There were modifications, again, to those um, that reflected the, the, the change as well. So there's three aspects to the, to the heritage changes. And, and what, what would be the total for the heritage changes? So um, I'll break it up. I'll base it on the, on the three components. So with respect to the aluminum assemblies, that's approximately 350K. Modification to the council windows is another modification to the 51 doors is another 333k which adds up to the million thirty three. Um, so the I'm assuming the doors haven't been done yet so this is kind of a new cost is that correct? Or, sure that is correct. And the um, the windows would that be the same? That is correct we're, still, we're just finalizing the design on the final windows before they actually so, but with the aluminum panel assemblies, did we in fact install things at some cost and now we're contemplating ripping it out and putting in new aluminum panels? Um, that is, I, I believe so. Do I'm not, I don't think to, so. Uh, check with my staff. Just give me a second. Uh, no, we don't. I don't think so. Sorry, you don't want. No, we do, we do not have to rip it up. So what, that's because the other ones were never installed? That is correct. Did we purchase them? Did we spend any money on them? Uh, no, we did not. Other than what, when it was determined that uh, the original ones that were installed, uh, we actually stopped production on, on the features and uh, aluminum panels. I'm sorry, I'm not following so, that. So, so in the original scope, we had, had uh, you know, priced the panels when, because we were buying them in, in stages and phases, so when we installed the first set of panels, then, and then when Heritage asked us to stop, then we stopped, so we have not installed any other uh, new panels as of yet. So we installed some panels? That's correct. And are we taking those panels out? For those specific ones, yes. <coughs> okay, and what's the...
cost of putting those in and then taking them out and putting in new panels? Uh, through the chair, I don't, I don't have those numbers, but I could get you what that uh, delta is. Um, and when could you get that? I, I could get you through that later today, Councillor. And um, could we have a bit more elaboration on the difference between panels? Uh, yes. We'll Do we have a picture ahead. or something like that? Um, yes, I, could, I believe I can get that for you, what the original, what the original spec was and what the, the new specification was. Well, I, I wouldn't really know from the spec. Do we have like what one looks like and what the other would look like and some kind of more detailed explanation on why? Yes, 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 we can. Yes, we have that. Do you have that now or do you have to get no, that? No, I'd have to get it for you. We don't, I don't have that readily available. Um, okay. I'm, it's difficult to make a decision without that information, but I'll, I'll turn it over to Councillor Holliday. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think Councillor Philly and I are. are on the same track with questions, and I wanted to go into a little bit more detail about the three changes so I can understand them better. One of the things I did is I, I happened to take a picture of City Hall this morning. I wonder if we could get that on the screen. It, it, it might help to visual, I'm a visual guy, it might help to figure out what the changes are that were proposed. Um, this is just a random shot walking across the square. Um, one of the things that was said was that there was changes to the glass the glass panels around the, the, win, the chamber windows for $350,000. Can, can you help me understand what the change is? Maybe we can, I don't know, can we zoom in on the chamber there with uh, So the, the changes haven't gone into, through the chair, sorry, the changes haven't gone into effect yet. So the, I can get, uh, I can get heritage preservation to speak to the actual visual uh, changes that they were required. Okay. Uh, good morning to you, Mr. Chair. I'm Mary McDonald, Senior Manager of Heritage Preservation Services. Um, I think one of the things that has to be appreciated here is as you move along in a project, the understanding of the details becomes more and more precise. And when uh, we arrived at the point of trying to understand the visual impact of what was being proposed, um, which is essentially um, driven by the fact that you had a, a single pane window, which is being replaced by a double pane window, which is inherently thicker, uh, which needs a different profile, clipping system, uh, angle, there are a variety of uh, factors involved in that. So our group was involved in trying to understand when we were at the appropriate moment um, before fabrication and um, installation what exactly the impact was going to be. So we requested some mock-ups, um, which took some time to get together. And in fact, my staff uh, ended up doing their own mock-up in order to understand. So the difference um, would have been, um, it's a little difficult to describe, but you would have a different shape to the podium if what was being proposed had been actually put forward because um, you had to put in a different bracing system, different clip system. Um, the fabrication was, the, the, the colors and the choices were not consistent um, with the original interior. And so overall, the accumulated number of uh, issues would have created, in our opinion, a ne negative impact on this important um, heritage property. So from, from this vantage point, would I notice a difference between the previous proposal and the current one? Um, you would notice a difference for certain, yes. And what would the, d the difference be? Um, the shape of the podium would be um, somewhat uh, changed. I mean, in, in terms of understanding the difference, you'd have to do it comparatively. You'd have to look to the original design, and that's what we base our review on. So knowing the difference would certainly depend on your understanding what the design intent of the podium was, um, but that's our job is to take a look at what, what that is. What do you mean by podium? 
Um, in the, uh, the council chamber windows and the shapes there. So are the windows, the clam shell. are the original windows a different shape than the, the newly proposed ones? I mean, they're rectangles, right? Yes, but they are installed um, on an angle. And so they have to be abraced in a particular way because they actually um, kind of cant out over in order to create a kind of a, a, a spaceship um, a shape. Okay. Okay, uh, the aluminum panels, what, what's, what, what are the proposed changes? I, I guess they're missing in this picture. Those would be the spandrels between the top and the bottom glass. Have I got that right? Yes, and, and that has to do with the, uh, the thicknesses, um, the material that was chosen, and the way in which uh, the windows are clipped into them. So they were, what were they, brown aluminum before or something like that? Uh, I believe they were brown aluminum before. And one of the things that's noted in the report is that over the years, because um, smaller changes had been made to the windows at certain points over time uh, to um, correct problems, but they hadn't been looked at holistically. So the opportunity is being taken here to provide continuity um, so that all the spandrels are the same, the windows are the same, and it will bring it back um, to its original configuration. So there's an opportunity here to have an efficiency in that as well. Okay, but, but we've made a bunch of changes. Like the, the roof deck of the podium is different. Uh, thank you. Are, are, if I just, what, what, what's up with the doors? Could you explain that? And I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chair. Um, the you. doors are not the same situation. I believe the doors were identified after, and I'll let my colleague explain that. Uh, the current state of the uh, building, if you look at the, uh, the second and first uh, floor windows at the, the front facade, uh, looks like it's sort of in a state of transition or in some cases disrepair. Uh, there are exposed metal fasteners uh, uh, to the windows. Uh, there are at least two places where there are wooden boards covering up uh, holes. Um, how long do we expect uh, this state of, uh, I would submit to you, sort of an embarrassing, you know, way of leaving it for visitors? Okay, it's unseemly to leave it in that in that state. The. Um, I'm confused about the process and sort of how we arrived. Uh, like, did, did it, to say it plainly, like, did it just dawn on certain staff that there would be heritage concerns later in, later in the process after decisions had been made with respect to tender? And then now are we spending more money to correct, to rec to correct um, perhaps communications that should have happened earlier on, or is that, is, is that what's happening here? Set a budget for a project, and a client and an occupant comes with, with, with change, whether it's yeah, it's, it's pre tender or post tender, that they understand the impact and the cost impact. I, I appreciate that you've learned from this, and that's that's important to know and good to know. But I'm asking before so you before you, you before you learn the lesson. Done a better job pre tender, absolutely. So what what it, what it, what it, what happened? What what went wrong? So 
I wasn't here when this project originally awarded, but I, I believe there was a transition uh, within Heritage, within with 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 the, the who, who awarded it uh, pre tender and then post tender. So I, I, I'm 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 seeing I'm seeing a a, a, a face of disagreement on on Mary. W would you would you uh, what, what is your perspective on that? Uh, it's not a face of disagreement. I think it's a variety of things. Uh, one of the things that's really important when you're doing the heritage work is having sufficient detail, including visuals, including mock-ups, um, at an early enough stage. So one of the things that we um, recognize is that while there was a review of um, the, 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 the concepts and the drawings, it's often and not uncommon even in the private sector to put off that mock-up stage until you actually have um, someone who's been awarded the contract who will then demonstrate those things. And it is generally the case that when those things are demonstrated, you see what you expect to see. And unfortunately, due to the complexity of the design system of this Windows, what, um, what we saw was what we believed was uh, too negative an impact to not say something about it at that point. So it is. But, but who didn't talk to who earlier? Like, what was there? Was there a mock-up that your your shop signed off on, and then they thought they were ready to go, or did they change it to a degree based on what you thought was going to be planned? That then later in the game you had to come and say, "Wait a sec, that's not right." Like, how did? No, a mock-ups actually. What I'm trying to explain is the mock-ups don't co typically come until later in the process. Okay. And I think what we need to understand in terms of having the best practice around this facility is we have to make sure that the most detailed information, including an understanding of visual impact, is presented and understood and signed so off. So once again, we're talking about prior though, to looking tender. forward, right? Yeah, so both of you your have answers have been, have been more about like, you know, lessons learned. That's great. Like I, I, I yeah. want to know that those lessons have been learned. I'm just trying to understand though what the mistakes were that then prompted these lessons to be learned. For example, uh, intuitively, I would submit to you that uh, for a building like this, arguably one of the most important uh, heritage buildings in our city, uh, that intuitively before we would make any uh, changes to this building, even for you know infrastructure type improvements, mm -hmm. the first thing we do is we make sure that our heritage preservation staff is comfortable with what's being proposed and have several check-ins along that path, so that something like this doesn't happen. I don't. I what I don't understand. I get, I appreciate looking forward. Everything's going to be bright and sunny and lovely. But I just mean now. Um, I I just don't understand why that wasn't done because it's the obvious intuitive thing to do. Well, last question, Kelly. It actually, w it was done. So then how did this happen? Um, well, Heritage staff reviewed the project as it was laid out at the time and had a certain expectation that the end result was going to be fine after looking at it. And typically, the city's carrying a heritage consultant at that point. We see visuals, we see renderings, we understand. This, we didn't have a lot of that kind of information, um, but the staff member did review it, um, did feel that the visual impact would not be too negative, mm -hmm. but there is a check-in point before you actually fabricate and do that where you have a mock-up to say, is what we thought, what we saw on the flat surface of the paper, yeah. going to actually be? So that is not uncommon to do it at the later. That is part of the check-in. Unfortunately, that in this case, the check-in revealed um, a negative uh, visual impact. So, so there wasn't that check-in between rendering and execution? No. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. No, but we caught it before the fabrications, which is the, the important that. thing, but figuring yeah. that out took time. Thank you. Yeah, I just really have a problem with this. So you caught it, but you caught it when it's too late because now we're asking for a, an increase in the budget. My question is, is that in the report, it says stakeholders were consulted prior to the start of the project, uh, project including heritage, and everyone signed off on it, like agreed and signed off on it. And then we go up for tender, um, 
and, and we go to the lowest bidder because they met all the requirements. So uh, what I don't understand then, so where we are today, then it, it really wasn't the lowest bidder. There were other, there were, we added other things onto that. So like, I, I don't know how this happens. Like why would we sign off and, and go to the lowest bidder and then at the end of the day, it's not the lowest bidder and we've added more requirements. Like we go through a process. Then, Well, you know, like, well, I, I don't understand why everyone signs off on it. So, I mean, this is really an issue because this is not the only contract that's come forward to this committee in the past where we've had to increase the budget because of issues and that have come up. Um, so, and, and another question. Um, in the report, it also says that once completed, we're expected to reduce maintenance costs in the future. So what does that mean? Anyway, uh, I just have a real problem with this. And Councillor Pilling, you're right, at the last meeting there was an, an, an item, mind you, that was a private, uh, the city didn't own that building. Uh, we discussed it at the last meeting. The only question I have in a nutshell, so on page three of six, in the middle of the page, where it says changes to project scope following contract award, or project overview. So the third paragraph where it says stakeholders were consulted, and it gives you a list of stakeholders. And then the very next paragraph under that, says following the contract award, the project scope was modified, and the list all the same stakeholders. So was there a substantial staff turnover between those two groups or I don't understand how all the, those, everybody was consulted, the contract was awarded and then the same departments went back and said, now we want changes. So Pat, I know that you said you weren't there at the beginning, but I don't understand how, I don't understand the relationship between those two paragraphs in a nutshell. I, I understand that. It lists everybody that was consulted in one paragraph, and then you go to the immediate paragraph, contract awarded, and then it lists everybody else that was consulted, and now the contract's gone up by $2 million. That's the problem in a nutshell that I have. What was the timeline between A and B? What was the time period? Was it a year, six months, two years? Sorry. And was it was it everybody that got reconsulted that had to put 
things back in, or is there a main, what was the main driver? And how much work was done pre-RFP to establish what had to be done on this building? Like this building's been here since 1965. I would expect that everybody would have spent a substantial amount of time figuring out the RFP. And then, so it's awarded, and then eight months later, it goes up by $2 million? because I'm, I'm not gonna speak for everybody on the committee, but for myself, I'm in a bit of a bind. So I'm the, we're the political face to the staff that have made this decision. You've, you've gone through a process that you're mandated to follow, and then after it, you go back, and then you wanna add $2 million to it that we have to approve because the work has to be done. If the work's not done, it causes bigger problems for us in the future. So that's the bind I'm in. You're asking me to approve something that needs to be done that should have been thoroughly flushed out as this work was being done. You don't have to answer that. That's my rhetorical question for the day. Sorry, Councilor Holiday, you have another to speak? Yeah. Okay. I know it happens all the time, but it shouldn't happen all the time. That's why I'm... Right. So I saw Councillor Holliday's hand first to speak. I should preface that, I just know we were working on a motion. Have we got that ready, is that okay? Not yet. Um, if I may, may I defer my speaking to another member just to get that ironed out? Sure. All right, does anybody else want to speak while the motions are being drafted? <laughs> Well, you don't have to kill some time. We can hold this item down and move to another item and That's come back fine, to it. Sure. So why don't we hold it down? We'll move to another item. And we'll come back to this one. Sorry, the next item we have on the agenda is number eight, amendment to purchase order number 6047367 with Deloitte LLP, which was held by Councillor Fillion. Councillor, do you have questions of staff? Uh, yes, I do. Um, question number one would be, um, this um, purchase order, the proposal is that it be quadrupled. So at, at what point um, is it unfair, improper, unwise to just extend a contract rather than um, going out to a new tender, given that the, the, um, what's being proposed here in no way resembles the original, in fact, is four times the size of it? Why is the suggestion that we amend the existing purchase order rather than retendering. Through the chair, Councillor, uh, Rob speaking here. Sorry, you can speak up, Rob. Sorry, I'm just getting a here, all right. Uh, again, through the chair, Councillor, what you have in front of you, I just wanna provide a little bit of a backdrop and some context that hopefully will address the question. Uh, we set out to acquire an enterprise-wide platform, um, as mentioned in my earlier presentation around customer relationship management. The process that we took was to um, start with a proof of concept in terms of piloting a couple of selected services to prove the technology, 
but also to validate the ability to integrate with some of our back office systems. So we started out with uh, proof of concept, specifically uh, with- well, And I, I, I hesitate to interrupt, but it, it's a, it was more of a, rather than a detailed explanation of this, it was a question of at what point do you go to a new tender rather than extending when you have something that's four times the size of the original, what's the, you know, what's the dividing line to when you don't, you know, it's kind of a general, a, a general question and specific to this as well, I guess. Um, okay, uh, again, through the chair, I hear the question, I'm gonna maybe try it a different angle then. The, the platform that we have selected enables capabilities both citizen facing but also back office operations. This particular extension, our second pilot is within the municipal licensing services where they have some front end services as was discussed that interact with 311. But also they're, they're looking at their back office transformation. They had a suite of systems that they are looking to replace including this new platform enables them to be able to achieve that transformation. Okay, that so, still isn't my question, so, so I'm not I, sure who can answer, but when um, do we have guidelines for at what point we go out to a new tender rather than extending the original one, and I'm especially asking that of this one in light of the fact that the new one is four times the size of the original. What are our guidelines around that? and how do we decide when to issue a new tender and when to um, expand the one we have? Through the chair, there's no specific guidelines. It's, it's rather uh, case by case where, where it makes sense to use the existing pro, uh, contractor to continue work is when we would first propose an amendment. If it's something uh, that has gone beyond, that is something new to what we were originally doing uh, that wasn't anticipated, that would be more uh, we would more drive towards uh, doing an comp open competitive process. But there may be other factors that we need to take into consideration like urgency um, that's, that has arisen that might uh, prevent us from doing an open competitive process. So my, my understanding in this case is that Deloitte has been here to do the first pilot and they are positioned well to help fill, do the second pilot um, for MLS. So, but what are the factors in that govern the, the recommendation here that um, you said there would be a number of factors. What are the factors here other than that they are well positioned? I, I, I pretty general statement. Um, to, to, through the chair, in this particular case, there was a, a, another RFP to replace the back end systems for MLS. In that competitive process, it, this platform was identified and selected. So it made sense to incorporate all of this in terms of our current, um, utilizing our current platform and agreement that we have. So it, I don't know if that answers your question, but there was. It, it, it doesn't, and oh. I see I'm out of time. Um, maybe you could give me a second round uh, after some others, thank you. Yeah, here we go again. Okay, so the the first pilot. What was the cost? Of the the first pilot. Because you're saying this is a second pilot. What was the cost of the first pilot? Uh, through the chair, that's uh, Gary. Um, in regards to the, the the phase one with Toronto Water, yeah, uh, that was approximately about five hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so for a second pilot, then it's an additional million five. Oh, well, uh, so why would it be uh, that amount for a second pilot when it was only five seventy seven for the first? The, the, well, there, there, there's two different aspects for it. To be very honest with you, through the chair. Okay, well, I don't know. And and and, and the, 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 the the biggest difference is the integration parts through the back end systems. So one part of the pilot really focused on the front end and some of the changes, whereas on, on, on the second part, which is, which is associated with MLS, 
it's a lot more work to do with the back end systems as well. So when we went out for tender um, originally, uh, when did we do this? When did it go out? Last year? In 2017. Yeah. Did, did we not include that as uh, further requirements and that there would be an, uh, an, uh, they, there, there would be an additional pilot? And what would the cost be at that time before we negotiated that contract? So we would know what the what additional cost it would be if we wanted to add on to the second? Uh, through the chair, to my understanding, the initial what? pilot did have the scope of MLS and Toronto Water, but a limited scope of one service for MLS. There was another tender that was bought, brought out, and what happened was when, when the overall solution, the, the, the vendor in question won both. And it made sense then, given the parameters that we're looking at, to amalgamate the scopes. While we have this lull, I just want to ask uh, what the intent of the committee is. So it's almost lunchtime. Uh, we have we have seven items. One, two. I've, we have seven seven items left. We either work through lunch or we can come back at one thirty. I have commitments. Paul. You have commitments. Okay, so we'll have to come back at one thirty. Councillor Holiday is shaking his head no. Okay, so we'll come back at 1.30. Sorry? Well, we're not on that item. We're in the middle of another one. Okay, so does anybody else, does anybody, sorry, we're, I know we have speakers on this item. So why don't we adjourn now and we'll come back at 1.30, a recess. Okay, thank you everyone.